Hey, Karen. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Now about seven minutes after one and we're running behind. <laughs> so we are going to go right into the scheduled presentations that was supposed to start at one and then we'll go back and pick up everything else that we're missing. So I know I'm going to repeat myself, but I do that for the benefit of the people who weren't here this morning. The shared goal, the state superintendent, state board, is to develop Michigan into a top 10 performing state over the next 10 years. As a step towards this goal, we've asked organizations to share three to five ideas on how we meet that goal. We're also gathering input from MDE staff as well as input from the field. Everyone is a stakeholder with regard to Michigan education and anyone wishing to provide input is welcome to do so by going to www.michigan.gov slash top 10 and 10 and we expect to have an overall plan finalized by the end of the year. So some ground rules for those presenting. We want to stay positive. We want to be a collaborative process. Each organization will have eight minutes to share their best ideas. We know you have much more than you could share than that and you're welcome to do that with information that you leave for us. We have a timer set so you'll be able to gauge your comments. In the interest of time, board members are asked to submit their questions to Marty Ackley and he'll coordinate with organizations to answer any questions board members may have. In the interest of time, there will be no questions and answers or conversations today. Uh, John, President John, do you have anything you want to add? Thank you. All right. We'll start right with our 1 o'clock presentation. Paula Cunningham from Citizens Leadership Council of Michigan, Children's Leadership Council of Michigan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, first of all, for taking the time and dedicating the time to talk to so many of us. Uh, I am, as you heard, Paula Cunningham. I'm state director of AARP Michigan. Uh, I am uh, also former president CEO of Capital National Bank and former president of Lansing Community College. I'm here today, however, as co-chair of the Children's Leadership Council of Michigan, a, a committee that I co-chair with Doug Luciani, who is the uh, CEO of the Traverse City Chamber of Commerce, as well as with 16 business leaders <laughs> who support high-quality early childhood <laughs> education and investments that are proven, and that's a key word, proven to make a real difference in young children's lives. <laughs> As business people, we are always looking for the ROI. Uh, we want to know what truly moves the needle, which investments really matter. The right early childhood <coughs> investments really matter. The Children's Leadership Council of Michigan has coordinated our efforts with more than 100 other business leaders from across the state to educate lawmakers and other policymakers on the value of wise investment in early childhood. In meetings with, with and letters to legislators and the governor, we have actively supported the expansion of the Great Start Readiness Program and Governor Snyder's efforts to strengthen early literacy with new birth to three investments in the fiscal year 16 budget. In doing our work, we have also partnered very closely with the Michigan Department of Education's Office of Great Start. And in fact, Susan Roman was a member of the Childhood Leadership Council before she became the first deputy superintendent leading OGS. We greatly appreciate the leadership that the state board has displayed in early childhood in full recognition of its importance to the successful education of Michigan's children. The Children's Leadership Council of Michigan was founded in 2010 because we wanted an organized and a compelling business voice for early childhood. Our council members have studied the research the strong foundation of evidence-based programs from pre-K to home visiting to child care to health care. And that research firmly shows that robust early childhood initiatives are essential to children's chances for thriving in K through 12, college, and in their careers. For many low-income children, the odds are stacked against them if they do not participate in such programs. Let me take a moment to explain how the uh, CLCM, or the Children's Leadership Council of Michigan, works. With support from several foundations, our 16-member Council of Business Leaders meets quarterly to develop its policy agenda, coordinate with OGS and traditional early childhood advocates, and decide upon strategies for educating lawmakers. With staff support from the Center for Michigan and policy sector consultants, we have prepared policy reports on GSRP and evidence-based birth through age three programs. We've testified before the legislative committees, 
We've met with senior Michigan Department of Education officials, Governor Snyder's staff, and lawmakers, and we've written letters to policy leaders. We have also coordinated letters that have been signed by more than 100 other Michigan business leaders in support of early childhood investments. We scrutinize the research and develop our policy agenda based on proven, proven return on investment in the short term and in the long term. Our work is grounded in what really works. The Children's Leadership Council of Michigan has championed the expansion of the Great Start Readiness Program, Michigan's high quality pre-kindergarten initiative. The $130 million increase in the last two years has allowed more than 21,000 additional Michigan four-year-olds to enroll in the program. <clears throat> there are 1,000 more children who are now in a full day preschool instead of half day and are getting transportation to the schools. These were two critical factors that had kept many low-income families from taking advantage of the program in the past. More than 37,000 four-year-olds are enrolled in Great Start Readiness programs this year, according to the Michigan Department of Education and an analysis by Bridge Magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a 61% increase in <coughs> two years. We commend OGS and the state's intermediate school districts for managing the aggressive ramp-up of these programs that followed the boost in funding. This matters because GSRP works. This particular program, designed, developed, and tested in Michigan, clearly moves the needle on student achievement. How do we know? The recent evaluation of GSRP and High School Educational Research Foundation tracked kids from pre-K all the way through high school. It showed that kids from low-income households in GSRP had higher levels of kindergarten readiness, better results on reading and math scores in early grades, and they graduated on time from high school at a much higher rate than children from low-income households who weren't in the program. And children of color in low-income households who were in GSRP graduated on time from high school 60% of the time versus 37% for children of color in low-income households who are not in a GSRP four-year-old program. This is a remarkable difference. The evidence is clear. A strong commitment to early childhood education is a game changer. It increases the likelihood that children will flourish in kindergarten and beyond. It is the most, it is the road to Michigan becoming a top 10 state for education. And so our, we have three recommendations. Our first recommendation is that GSRP be maintained at its current levels, even in face of the difficult and challenging state budget. Governor <coughs> Snyder's third grade reading initiative, or third grade reading proficiency, is unquestionably one of the best indicators for future success, both academically and economically. As we stated earlier, one of the reasons we strongly support the GSRP expansion is precisely because we believe it will improve third grade reading proficiency. But it isn't the only action that needs to be taken to address Michigan's unacceptably low third grade reading proficiency levels. And we agree with the governor and OGS that a more comprehensive strategy is necessary. In fact, we believe very strongly in nurturing children in their first years of life, as these are the four years that last a lifetime. What happens to our children in those first 1,000 days? How parents, other caregivers protect them, <coughs> read to them, encourage their minds and bodies to grow, sets the pattern for a lifetime. As you decide which initiatives will have the greatest impact on getting kids ready to learn and move the needle <laughs> on third grade reading proficiency, we urge you to avail yourself of the recent report offered by public sector consultants and the Citizens Research Council, policy options to support children from birth to age three. This report states that extensive research has based demonstrates that early investment in home visiting, child care, early pre-K, and medical homes is far more effective than later remediation. Our second recommendation then is to expand wise investments in proven programs for infants and toddlers and their families. Finally, I'm looking at the clock, I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Finally, as we have already emphasized, we strongly believe in accountability. After all, this isn't about just doing something that feels good, but for us as business people, it's about the ROI, increasing third grade reading proficiency, reducing the number of students replacing grades, and so our third recommendation is to evaluate early childhood programs carefully and thoughtfully to understand what really works and hold us accountable to that. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for being here and sharing with us. Next, we have John from the Center for Michigan. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Superintendent Whiston, uh, President Austin, and fellow board members. The Center for Michigan is pleased to answer your call for testimony today. As, we, as we've explained in previous testimony, the Center for Michigan is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization. We develop ideas for improving education through a two-step process. First, we ask the public what they want. Each year, we travel the state and talk to thousands of Michigan residents about their public policy priorities. 40,000 people have taken part in our community meetings, statewide polls, policy conferences, and other public engagement activities in recent years. As one example, we previously provided the board with copies of our report, the Public's Agenda on Public Education, <coughs> we call it our shiny apple report. Second, we put a fine point on the public's priorities through the in-depth journalism of Bridge, Bridge Magazine, which we publish. In the past three years, Bridge special reports have outlined ways to improve and intensify early childhood education, improve teacher quality, and learn from other ed leading education states. Rather than flood you with paper today, I have one simple handout called What We've Learned About Learning which summarizes much of the center's work and policy priorities concerning K-12 education. And board member Eileen Weisner was uh, kind enough to grab my stack and promise to pass them out. They're so here. thank you, Eileen. <laughs> um, I'd like to leave you with three observations today. Uh, first, start at the start. Michigan should keep going on early childhood education. As Paula Cunningham just noted, Michigan has led the nation the past three years in public preschool expansion. This is a great achievement and team effort among policymakers, early childhood advocates, and educators across the state. But the early childhood work isn't done. Our research and in-depth journalism suggests that the high priority of boosting third grade reading proficiency can be <coughs> further achieved through preschool for vulnerable three-year-olds, improved home visiting programs, and overhaul of the state's child care systems, among other means. A second observation. Michigan should keep going on teacher quality initiatives. The center's public engagement work shows Michigan residents clearly want both more education accountability and stronger support for educators. A comprehensive and rigorous statewide educator evaluation system is at the intersection of those public priorities. Bridge Magazine has written a great deal about this issue, as has the Department of Education. We encourage the state board and Superintendent Whiston to keep going. In its most recent statewide survey of educator evaluations, the Michigan Department of Education concluded that, quote, much work remains to be done in assessing precisely how these evaluations are conducted and whether these evaluations truly are, as the law states, rigorous, transparent, and fair. MDE data says that more than 90% of Michigan school districts are using an evaluation model recommended by the Michigan Council for Educator, Educator Effectiveness. MDA, MDE data also states that 44% of districts are using a locally developed model or another model. We are eager for deeper analysis and oversight of education tools districts are using and how they are using them. Additional educator evaluation legislation remains under consideration at the Capitol. It was unfortunate that widely supported compromise legislation did not pass last December. We sense that Superintendent Whiston is concerned about how to proceed. We point out that leading states are well beyond Michigan in terms of improving educator quality, learning results, and transparency through statewide evaluation tools and student growth models. And we remain hopeful that the recommendations of the Michigan Council on Educator Effectiveness can be fully adopted over time. Also, we encourage the department to keep going on aggressive rewrites of teacher certification exams as called for by recent state budget appropriations in reaction to our Building a Better Teacher report, which we've shared with you previously. Likewise, we encourage strong oversight of college teacher prep programs to assure new teachers are truly prepared for the classroom realities and rigors of their chosen profession. Finally, <clears throat> we urge the board to look carefully at career navigation and counseling issues over time. Next week, the Center for Michigan will release our latest public agenda report after another 150 community meetings and large statewide polls and online surveys this year. We hope you will consider attending a half-day conference on these issues October 5th at Schoolcraft College in Livonia. 
We have more than a dozen confirmed speakers for the event. It's at that time that we will be discussing in a lot more detail the results of what we're going to release next week, which I think you'll find quite interesting. Uh, those speakers include leaders from Indiana and Ohio who are working to bolster career navigation and counseling in those neighboring states. And we're also very glad that Karen McPhee from the governor's office uh, has agreed to join us with that day. Uh, full details on that conference and others we're holding uh, this fall are available on our website. We will release that public agenda report next Monday and we'll be, we'll be sure to include all board members in our distribution list. The Center for Michigan staff is glad to meet with any of you at your convenience to discuss our work in more detail. Thank you very much for your time today. John, thank you for being here for your recommendations. Next, we have Brian uh, Broderick from Michigan Association of Non-Public Schools. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Broderick, Executive Director of the Michigan Association of Non-Public Schools. I'd like to thank State Superintendent Whiston and the State Board of Education for the invitation to speak with you today and share the perspective of, of Michigan's faith-based school community on how to make Michigan a top 10 education state in the next 10 years. Faith-based schools have a long history in Michigan, uh, educating children really since the 1800s, even since before we became a state. Uh, MAN's member schools and continue to produce high-performing students, follow accreditation standards, employ state-certified teachers, and comply with all the state-mandated health, safety, and reporting requirements, all while not receiving any funding from the state of Michigan. And all of this while saving the state school aid fund approximately $700 million annually. MAN's represents pre-K through 12 schools in the seven Roman Catholic dioceses in Michigan, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and Christian Schools International. Our membership includes over 400 <coughs> schools, 5,000 teachers, and close to 90,000 students statewide. Approximately 80% of school-aged children in Michigan's non-public schools attend a man's affiliated school. I'd like to discuss, or I'd like to focus this discussion on three areas that we believe need particular attention in order for Michigan to become a top 10 state. These three critical elements are site-based management, parental involvement, and expanded school choice. I do want to acknowledge what has already been said by many of my colleagues is extremely important, the emphasis on poverty and how the state can take measures to address how poverty negatively impacts learning is easily the most critical factor that needs to be addressed in order for Michigan to show any significant gain in anyone's top 10 list. You have also heard critical information about the need to align curriculum, assessment, and accountability with a focus on instruction. I don't have anything new to add to that discussion other than to reiterate, reiterate how vitally important it is for the state to have a laser-like focus on improving instruction, providing relevant professional development, and a myriad of other tools that are available to advance teacher quality in Michigan. And just to add on what we heard earlier, the focus on third grade reading proficiency and funding for uh, pre-K pre is very important things that the board needs to look at as well as other policymakers in the state. First, we believe there are lessons to be learned from how non-public schools are managed. A hallmark of education in the private sector is the concept really of site-based <coughs> management. The power, authority, and accountability are held in the school, led by a strong administrator and a common vision within that school community. The primary goal of this type of management is to shift authority away from an administrative hierarchy into the hands of school groups, principals, and teachers who are closer to the students, theoretically better equipped to meet the needs of those students. There are significant hurdles to the autonomy of individual public schools, not the least of which is the multi-headed education policy-making structure in this state, from the <coughs> governor to the legislature, this, this state board, hundreds <coughs> of school districts, and the list goes on. Nonetheless, site-based management as a reform initiative should be accelerated where it has begun and started where it is not. That may mean a consolidation of Michigan school districts or a host of other reforms that allow educators and communities to be empowered in directing the education of their students. Parental involvement is another critical element in making Michigan a top 10 state. The tuition-based model of Michigan's faith-based schools certainly is a powerful incentive for parental involvement. <coughs> Parents at man's member schools not only support their public school with taxes, but also pay tuition at the school they chose as the best fit for their child. A de facto baseline responsibility for all parents in our society as the first educators of their children. There's widespread agreement that parental involvement is critical to student performance. 
it is at first glance obvious to most. That is, engaged parents will have a strong influence on their children's success. Research on the effects of parental involvement has shown a consistent positive relationship between parents' engagement in their children's education and student outcomes. That said, it's probably the most difficult issue to address as there are so many societal factors that impact the ability of parents to be involved. In addition to that, we have policy limitations in Michigan that limit the most basic right of parents, particularly low-income parents, regarding where to send their child to school. Strategies that include outlining of expectations, regular communication to parents, training for teachers and administrators on how to engage parents, and opportunities for parents to interact with school personnel should be implemented and maintained. The third item uh, addressed regarding school choice, Michigan has moved a significant way down the school choice pathway over the last 20 years with the advent of charter schools, public district schools of choice, virtual schooling, and expansion of dual enrollment programs. The final frontier, as it were, is of course choice that would include non-public schools. Michigan's 1970 constitutional language that prohibits direct and indirect aid to non-public schools has served to make Michigan unable to respond to the growing nationwide trend of expanding school choice to private schools. If it is fair to equate poverty with lack of opportunity, then we as a state must act now to provide education opportunity to those in poverty, as has been done in Milwaukee, Cleveland, Washington, D.C., New Orleans, just to name a few cities, and many states where an array of choice is given to parents. Currently, 28 states have some mechanism that gives parents options to choose the best education setting for their children. These states have adopted a multitude of innovative programs that are often means-tested provide valuable resources and help sustain education opportunities that have been successful for generations. Michigan is precluded from looking at any of these options due to its onerous and outdated constitutional ban. In 2015, we have a goal of being a top 10 education state by 2025, and yet we are saddled with a 1970 policy that does not serve the current need. The Constitution issue goes beyond though just mechanisms that other states are able to use to assist parents in making the right choice for their children. Tax credits, vouchers, opportunity scholarships, ESAs, and other forms of school choice are all precluded by the Michigan Constitution. The language is so onerous that it also stymies the ability of policymakers to implement a statewide vision for academic excellence for all students. There are many examples that may be cited to demonstrate this inequity. I will use a recent one involving a statewide grant competition to illustrate the point. On August 27th, Michigan Department of Ed invited all public schools to apply for a grant for the Inspiration and Support of Tech First Robotics Competition Grant. It's a national program that the legislature appropriated $2 million for in the 2015-16 fiscal year out of the State School Aid Act. The state purpose of this grant is to support the State Board of Education's mission in making all students graduate ready for careers, college, and community. In this case, all means some because non-public schools are precluded from applying as the money funding the program comes from the state school aid fund and therefore is designated only for those Michigan residents attending public schools. MDE's hands are essentially tied from its stated mission of making all students ready by a barrier that seemingly seeks to shield the state from the creation of what would be Catholic or Lutheran robots. Of course, a student in a non-public school can take a robotics course as a public school student under shared time using state school aid money that is paid to the public district. <coughs> the incongruity is startling and representative of the incoherence in Michigan education policy that is unable to, to not only support full parental choice, but also unable to support all Michigan students by virtue of what school they attend. In summary, the, the task before the state is immense. You have heard and will continue to hear a lot of excellent ideas and policy prescriptions that will move Michigan further toward being a top 10 education state if fully implemented. Go on. What I'm offering in this short time with you is really is a call to implement policies that make education decisions closer to the students that are impacted via site-based management of the school, provide an increased level of parental involvement, especially for the disadvantaged by support of policies that open up a full array of choice that should be available to parents and a request for coherence by all those setting education policy in the state so that truly all students are afforded the opportunity to be college, career, and community ready upon graduation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for being here. Next up, we have Amber and Sunil, if I'm pronouncing that right, I hope. Thank you. Good 
Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Amber Ariano. I'm the Executive Director of the Education Trust Midwest. And I'm really very pleased to be here today and honored to, to be invited to have this time to talk with you um, and share some of the thinking that we've done um, over the last five years about making Michigan a top ten education state. Um, um, I know we're on a tight schedule, so I'll get through. So for those of you who aren't aware of our organization, we're a nonpartisan um, research and evidence-based organization um, focused on um, how to make Michigan a top 10 education state, um, including um, students of color and for low-income students. Achievement gap closing is really at the heart of our mission. Um, and so when we think about um, making Michigan a top 10 education state, we want to make sure that all kids are brought up to high levels of learning. Um, not just affluent students or, or for white students. We're affiliated with the National Education Trust. Um, a trust has been open for more than 25 years today. Um, it is really considered now the oldest organization in the country um, devoted to closing achievement gaps um, and involved in the, at the federal level in education policy and nonpartisan research. So in May, we actually launched a new campaign to make Michigan a top 10 education state. So we have a lot of alignment with the board and with the new superintendent's vision and with the governor's office vision on this. And we're really um, particularly delighted that Governor Snyder and Superintendent Whiston have made um, really the place to start is um, around third grade reading. And as all of you know, um, early literacy skills are fundamental to success um, over the course of a K-12 career and in life. Um, we, we can't learn how to um, succeed in a job or in the rest of our academic life if we're not, um, we're not reading. So we're setting a goal of a third grade reading improvement by 2020 um, um, because after the modeling that we did, we thought that that was a realistic place to start. So first, um, let me give you some background on that. Today, Michigan is one of only six states with negative, showing negative improvement for early literacy. Um, we're among only six states that actually showed um, negative growth. So that means that our students in 2003 were learning at higher levels um, than they were, um, they were over the last couple of years. Um, you can see in the, in the bar here where the national public average is for um, improvement in early literacy. Um, this slide is a base on improvement. So when, this is not even looking at performance. We're a very low performing state today. Um, as well. This gives you a sense of how low performing Michigan is. Um, this is a, a global look, as, as all of you know. Um, our, our kids today are not just competing with kids in Alpena and, and Grand Rapids and Detroit, and they're not just competing with kids in other states, they're now competing with kids um, for, for new economy, global, in a globalized economy. They're competing with kids um, from around the world. And this gives you a sense of how low performing Michigan really is today. Um, toward the bottom um, quartile there, you can see where the United States public school average is. Um, there are many countries between um, um, uh, up and down the rankings there. We also show you the highest performing um, state for education in the country, and that's Massachusetts. Massachusetts is so high performing today um, that it's actually, if it was its own country, it would be among the top countries in the entire world. Um, so we have identified in, in recent years through research um, who are the, the top performing education states in the country and what can we learn from them. Massachusetts is clearly, um, is clearly this, is a model state for us. Um, this gives you a sense of what we need to do, the current path that Michigan is on um, to become top 10 in early literacy by 2030. Um, we're on track to be 44th in, um, by 2030. Um, it gives you a sense of where we've got to go um, from now and then to, to catch up with the rest of the country. And for those who think that um, it's really our kids of color or our, our poor students, we hear that a lot from people. Well, if it wasn't for our poor students, if it wasn't for those kids in Detroit or those kids in Pontiac, um, we would be doing much, much better. The truth is that is fundamentally um, incorrect. Um, our white students are now among the lowest performing white students in the United States. Um, if we continue on our <coughs> current path, white students for fourth grade reading will be 49th in the United States for fourth grade learning, uh, for fourth grade literacy. 
So we know that um, our education problem in Michigan is not about poverty simply, and it's certainly um, certainly not um, isolated to communities of color or urban communities. This is a statewide problem. It, it affects every student in every every group, um, white, brown, black, um, high income, low income, and um, and we're all in this together. And so we think we need to move forward together using strategies that was, we would say that really lift all boats, that will lift up all kids and really help all of our students catch up with the rest of the country. So for us, the good news is, and, and the, the, the thing that we really like to point out um, when we deliver a, a lot of this bad news, um, my husband often calls me um, the reaper of hope. Um, and he'll joke to me when I go out and do a data presentation like this, he'll say, well, whose hope did you kill today, honey, right? And, um, and so we really like to emphasize that um, while we have made um, dramatic declines in student achievement and while we are now trailing um, not only much of the country but the world, um, there are lots of states that have gone through um, dramatic turnaround in just a matter of five to ten years. And there's a lot that we can learn from them. Um, over the last two years, we've studied um, extensively leading education states like Massachusetts, uh, like Tennessee, like Maryland, like Florida, to really look at what are the investment strategies and, and the um, statewide coherent, thoughtful kind of um, agenda that they move forward with lots of, of different um, stakeholders getting behind um, a vision that really made sense. <coughs> Here are some of the, um, the takeaways. These are very high level and we'd be happy to talk with anybody in more detail about any of these. One, that educators matter a lot. Um, Educators are a lot like parents. I mean, we know that in families, parents matter an awful lot, right? And in schools, um, educators matter a, a, an enormous amount um, for kids. Um, uh, the quality of a, of a teacher in front of a classroom is one of the most important predictors of a child's student achievement given year to year. So in all of these states, they made major investments and really thought systemically about what they could do to build more support for teachers and principals in particular, and also a really intensive capacity building strategies, right, around, um, around helping um, schools perform at higher levels. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, accountability and state capacity building are really important. Um, and while there's been a conversation about more investment and in, in higher spending levels in Michigan, and we think that should be a, a part of the conversation, it's not the only part of the conversation, and we need to think about how we spend effectively, not just more. Um, we've, we've actually begun to, to outline a plan that rests on, that is a two-pong strategy, one around um, focusing on strategies that boost student achievement, um, focus particularly P3, and then, um, and then high leverage strategic <coughs> investments that will help us get there. Um, this is sort of a, a, a general sense of what that, those buckets look like. And again, we'd be happy to talk with any of you in more detail if you're interested in that. So you guys have the packets on your, you do, you do um, and those are some of the metrics that we'll be tracking and reporting on publicly annually. Um, on how we're doing um, on some really important metrics about how we're doing and whether are we really on track to become top 10 for improvement, again, not even for performance, because based on our modeling, it's physically impossible for mission to become top 10 in the next 10 years. Um, it's, it's much more realistic for a 20-year plan at this point, given how low performing we are. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate uh, you being here and the detailed report recommendations you've given us. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up, we have Judy from the League of Women Voters. Judy. Thank you for being here. My name is Judy Karanjeff, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Michigan. And thank you for the opportunity to address the state board and the Department of Education about the top 10 uh, education reforms. The League's first position on public education was adopted over 50 years ago in 1969. 
Um, we have updated that program since then, and we still maintain a position that a strong and fair public education is at the core of economic stability. We support a publicly financed public education system in which there is equal opportunity for an excellent education available to all children in Michigan. Legislative requirements combined with dynamic social, physical, emotional, and economic considerations certainly create challenges to the ability of schools to meet the diverse needs of students. However, identifying ways to ensure all children have access to quality schools is the path that generates the best return on taxpayer investment. The, regarding structure, the League believes in a system that places an elected school board as the body that establishes and monitors achievements of standards for all publicly funded schools. But just as our schools are diverse, we advocate for uh, <coughs> diverse school boards that include people such as, that are, um, such as teachers, educational administrators, parents, businesses, related professionals such as physical and mental health experts, and post, uh, representatives from post-secondary institutions. Education is more than reading and writing and arithmetic. It includes learning and promoting health and hygiene and social and physical growth. And the League supports the concept of educational choice so parents can determine with their children what is the best education fit. While there can be needs that are better met by schools with distinct delivery systems, all public funded schools should be accountable to the same standards of excellence. Regarding finance, we support that federal and state and local governments share responsibility for financing education. We oppose any effort to use public funds for non-public education except where it's already required by law for auxiliary services. A voucher system is contrary to us, uh, the concept of a public system. We believe that the state sales tax and local property taxes are good resources for education funding and it's the state's responsibility to ensure that funding is fairly dispersed throughout the state in a manner that, that takes certain equalizing factors into account. Very important to every public system is the need for transparency and funding, record keeping and decision making. Just as we want transparency in government, we also want it at our schools and we think this needs to be available to the citizens of the school districts. Regarding educational goals, the League supports common core state standards as a minimum goal for every institution to attain. Uh, these should be based on the skills and knowledge that every citizen should know before they reach adulthood. Programming at various population ensures maximum successes for all school students from remedial to gifted programs. Schools should provide enough flexibility to ensure all students are appropriately challenged to achieve their potential. Intervention should be based on the district's diverse populations and aimed at promoting success. <coughs> Ultimately, knowledge of community demographics and needs should provide room for flexible programming. The federal requirement of high, highly qualified school should be employed throughout the education system. In particular, academic demands and building blocks associated with middle and high school require that teachers hold certification in those areas of their responsibility. Teachers working directly with special needs children should hold appropriate certification and any void should be uh, filled in a timely manner. Regarding instructors and administrators, we think the state should have a system of ensuring professional standards of personnel working with students. And these should include professional development opportunities that address updates in curriculum, use of technological tools, classroom management, and more. 
Districts should be cautioned not to add to the teaching workload without adequately supporting teachers, either through training or classroom support. Additionally, the state should conduct audits to ensure post-secondary teaching institutions are adequately preparing teachers for their certifications and their teaching roles in public schools. The State Board of Education could work with secondary schools to help ensure that post-secondary schools are training teachers at a rate to meet that demand. Regarding assessments and evaluations, the League believes that we should aim not only at evaluating where students and teachers and institutions stand at a given moment, they should provide a historical perspective and a roadmap to improve performance. The League supports assessments for students, teachers, and institutions as a means to ensure benchmarks are met or continuous improvement is shown. Standardized testing could bring need unnecessary stress to everyone in the institution and should only be used when necessary and appropriate. Student assessments should take into account the diversity of student populations. Core curriculum should be part of assessments, but they should also include cross comparisons of progress from various previous benchmarks, statistical demographic data related to economic and social measures, and the number of special needs students and supplemental classroom personnel. Teacher evaluations should be based on established observation tools and an understanding that student success is influenced by more than the teacher's efforts. School and district assessments should follow a formula that includes student and teacher assessments, but should also include surveys that address whether staff teachers, special ed, office administrative, food service, janitorial staff feel the district is adequately supporting them to achieve educational ex excellence. In addition, local and intermediate school districts should have a voice in whether the state has adequately supported them in meeting their educational benchmarks. I hope this information is helpful as you develop your ten, as you work on your goals to make uh, Michigan one of the top ten education states. And we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Judy, thank you for being here and sharing thank your you. thoughts with us. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next on the agenda is Don Watruba, Michigan Association of School Boards Executive Director. Good afternoon. Superintendent Weston and President Austin and the rest of the board. Uh, my name is Don Watruba. I represent the Michigan Association of School Boards. I'm their new executive director. With me is Cindy Ganson, MASB's uh, Board of Directors President, who also serves on the Genesee ISD Board and on the Flushing Local Board of Education. I just wanted to take an opportunity, Superintendent Wisted, board members, to thank you for the opportunity for us to share ideas to make Michigan a top 10 education state. It's an excellent way to gather information from a variety of educational resources and create a plan for leading children to excellence. MASB is looking to engage and strengthen boards of education across the state to perform more proficiently and knowledgeably to improve student achievement. We look forward to continued interaction in meeting your goal for Michigan. I want to spend some time talking a little bit about MASB for those that are not familiar with us. Um, our primary focus as an organization is board development and training and advocacy on behalf of public education and specifically boards of education in the state of Michigan. Uh, we've been around since 1949. We represent currently 541 school districts, 56 intermediate school districts, uh, 10 PSAs and have over 4,000 individual school, school board members. Um, we also include the superintendents when we think of who are in our membership because we think it's really important to view the board superintendent as a team in running a school district, not just boards of education or superintendents and in individual silos. Something that I think often gets left behind in the discussion on education is board governance and the importance that that actually serves in an effective uh, educational system. Uh, we actually have national research that is out there that actually talks 
um, about effective traits of board members. And when you look at boards of education that actually hold the eight traits that I've uh, distributed out to you, um, those are districts that have high student achievement numbers. So board governance is not an aside. It can be a key part of advancing student achievement and with districts and with our organization, of course, we really believe it's imperative that that leadership starts at the top and works through. And uh, talking about some ways that we can work together as the school board association and as local governments, governance boards and yourselves, <coughs> I'll just highlight a few of the traits. Um, boards that are accountability driven. And our board of directors and myself would argue that's not only accountability of the district, but it's accountability to each other as board members. That we have to figure out a way to make sure that boards hold themselves accountable um, for their leadership and for their behavior as board members. Um, align and sustain resources. School boards only can do uh, a good job with what resources they have. And we think it's imperative as the board and the legislature looks at where we're going to be in 10 years that we look at a sustainable funding model. And with Proposal A being in existence now for over 20 years, it is time to have a conversation about how we fund public education in Michigan, uh, and we would like to be a part of that. I mentioned already leading as a united team. A district has to be run with a superintendent and a board working together collaboratively and in communication. We really feel, as I know this board and Superintendent Wiston have mentioned, a quality evaluation system of superintendents and administrators will foster better communication between the board and superintendent. It'll put the boards in the places that they're supposed to be as far as their roles and responsibility, really evaluating the superintendent and passing on the policy governance and letting the superintendent run the day-to-day -day operations. And the last thing is development as a team and knowledge as board members. And I mentioned that is one of our fundamental roles at MASB is board leadership and board development. And you'll see some information as far as our organization. We currently offer 67 three-hour classes to boards of education on their role as board members. We don't offer all of them at one time, of course, um, but we have them available. During the year, we're probably teaching more than 130 <laughs> classes to board members across the state, sometimes at our conferences, sometimes in their counties, sometimes directly at school districts themselves. We get requests every year from boards and from counties to come out, or ISDs or RISAs, to come out and offer the classes on site. Um, that's something that we've really uh, tried to expand in recent years. And all of our classes are taught by subject content experts. Whether if it's school finance, we're talking and having a business manager or a former business manager teach it. If it's advocacy, we're having somebody that has lobbied and done it for a living, teaching board members about how important it is to advocate and how best to do that. 46% of our members, however, have never taken a class from MASB. Only 35% have taken one class. And only 19% have actually achieved what we call certification at level one, uh, which is a series of classes, uh, uh, in essence 10, over the period of their career as a board member. Some get it done in the first eight months and others never take that piece on. It's an unusual place for MASB, but we actually started two years ago advocating for state mandatory board training in this state. Um, 25 other states in the country adopt mandatory state training for board members. Um, I will say the governor recognized the importance of it last year in his budget and best practices, put money in, aside in <coughs> best practices. That was one of the ways to access that money. Of course, it didn't make it through the final budget. It was only focused on those boards that were in financially struggling districts. We would argue that it should be across the board for, for all boards. And part of that is because in our election cycle a year ago, we had over 700 new board members that sat on local boards. And when you see that kind of turnover on a regular basis, training is very important, particularly when we're asking board members to take on the roles that they are and the kind of depth of knowledge that they, they need to have. The problem that we have in general even conceptually with that. We looked at the filing deadline last August for running for boards of education, and nearly 10% of the seats weren't filed for. Nobody filed to run for their local board in August. And even when we hit November, we had seats remain unfilled. People didn't even file as a write-in. And if there's anything that I can ask of the state board 
and we're going to embark on a campaign backed by our board of directors because they feel it's very important. Um, how do we bring serving on a local board of education back to the forefront of people's minds as a public service to their communities and to the state as a whole? Um, and we're going to reach out to as many people as we can. Um, uh, not so much, you know, people say put your money where your mouth is. I'd say put your members where your mouth is and reaching out to other membership associations across the state. <coughs> How do we get people to serve on boards of education? Um, we have great board members across the state. We need to continue that trend, and we need to get more people that are of high quality. Uh, previous speaker talked about from all walks of life. There is no specific one that I would say it makes a great board member, but ultimately we have to do a good job as a general education community on encouraging good people to run for boards and encouraging, in some cases, any people to run for boards based on those numbers. And then as, as a state, uh, as an association, we figure out how do we train those board members and give them the knowledge that they need to, in, in partnership with their superintendents, govern their local district and bring about the student achievement numbers that I think everybody in this state so desperately needs. Um, so going back on kind of my summary, it's we really need training for board members in this state. We really need an all-out effort to find people that will actually run and sit on their boards of education uh, and do kind of that public service that I think as a state and as a, as a nation we were founded on. I think 20, 30 years ago you saw more of it and we need to figure out a way to get people back into that mindset. Thank you very much. Cindy, thank you, Don, thank you very much for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks. Next up, we have Chris Weijen, Michigan Association of School Administrators, Executive Director. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My record is eight minutes and 27 seconds, so I really apologize. I'm trying to cut it down, but I've got a lot to say. Um, thank you for, for everyone for listening. I've, I've seen so many of you over the years. I'm here today, as everyone is, to talk about Michigan being the top ten in public education in ten years. And you'll see on my graphic I have or sooner. I think we need to move as quickly and as appropriately as possible because we have millions of kids who are educated during that ten years, and we want to make sure that they aren't left behind. So some quick opening comments. You'll see on the graphics that we have the state of Michigan, um, including the UP, of course, and we need to remember that when we reform education in Michigan, that we have the top, the bottom, the side to side, and all kids do matter. Um, as mentioned, I am the executive director of the Michigan Association of School Administrators. It's the professional organization for all the superintendents in the state. Um, I recently retired from 35 years in public education, 25 of those as a superintendent in K-12 and Reese's and ISDs, and it's a pleasure to represent the superintendents, and I started my job on March 7th, so I'm still transitioning in, but I'm very excited. So when I was asked to do this, I had a deja vu. Been in the business for 35 years, I've worked a lot with reform at the district, at the state, and um, here we are again. But it's different this time. I think we have some new players around the table, and that doesn't mean it's better or smarter. It means there's a transition time, and usually the window is open for some change and I sense that's the case. Some of what you're going to hear today comes out of a group called the SSRC, the Systemic School Reform Committee that was formed by MASA a couple of years ago and then included a number of state associations and organizations. I feel strongly that action is necessary and I feel strongly that it has to happen before 10 years are up and so I'm going to present four recommendations from MASA. By the way, all of our members have seen these recommendations and I've received a lot of <coughs> feedback over the past week. So the first of the concepts is a pre-K-14 system. And systems is in quote because I'm not sure this all has to happen under one roof, but we certainly need to tie the system together. And the first is early literacy. And while we support third grade reading, of course, we want all children to be at that level. I'm talking about the research that shows what happens to a child's brain between birth and age three or birth and age five. 
It's, uh, you don't, no one has refuted that research. There are books written, there are studies done, there are best practices around the state. And quite frankly, if we work till kindergarten to start working on reading, we've waited too long. Wraparound services, I think that's where we can really improve at the community and state level. We need to make sure that children come to school ready to learn and feel safe, and I think there's a lot more we can do in that area. On the other end of the spectrum, middle, early college. We have great examples out there where students are walking out of high school with an associate's degree after two years at no cost to them. It's, it, we won't have to rebuild that. It's, it's being done currently. And I really like to focus on continue college and career ready. You, some of you will remember five, six, ten years ago we talked about every child going to college. I think we've all embraced now that that's great for some, but we want to make sure that other children who might not be headed to college do get the training and the qualifications they need to be career ready. I really support that. And I would like to end that recommendation with saying there are great models out there. There are best practices. We know where they are and we can help identify. We don't have to build this from scratch. The second is an appropriate school funding structure. I get nervous when I hear the word adequate because if we're going to be a top 10 state, I'm not sure the word adequate funding builds up to that. What about appropriate? Appropriate funding. Um, I'm a little disappointed in the RFP for the adequacy study that they're going to focus on the current system we have. And that's great, but I'm really interested in the, in the system we could have and what funding would be appropriate. So I'm hoping that whoever gets that work will take a look into the future with the rest of us. I think we need to define and assure equity no matter where you live in the state, that you have an opportunity to have a, a successful career tech education experience. You have a successful opportunity uh, to be in an AP class or in an honors class or any other classes you might need. And I won't take your time right now, but there are examples of where students have a wonderful opportunity for career tech and in other counties they don't have that opportunity. And I think until we answer the equity problem, we won't get to the top 10. And then, as has been mentioned in previous um, presentations, we need to pay attention to poverty and more. There are students with special needs out there beyond our, our special education programs, but there's poverty and there's all types of things, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to get to that point as well if we're really going to assure equity for all students. <coughs> Number three, accountability and appropriate assessment evaluations at all levels. I'm talking here about children, I'm talking about adults. But first, and I think you might remember from Wendy's presentation from MESSP, and I'm quoting here, we need to align the curriculum, assessment, accountability, and in capital letters, instruction. And our members are really, really focused on trying to focus on instruction. And that would include things like personalized learning as well as technology to make sure that our students are ready for where we're already at, and that's the digital age. Educator evaluation, let's get it done. I should have added the word right to that because let's get it done right. But we really need to get that finished. We need to get that wrapped up. We have people out in the field right now whose careers and lives depend on a quality evaluation service instrument. And so I would hope that we would get beyond whatever cloud there is right now and get that done very soon. We also need to get it done in the area of student growth. We need a decision and a solution. Um, I really appreciate MDE's latest effort to compare growth of a student against the cohort level rather than all of the other kids. Um, but we have some areas to work on this. Um, Superintendent Whiston has appropriately put together a statewide assessment work group where we have practitioners working with MDE to try to find out what's the appropriate way to measure growth. And then we need to monitor the federal <coughs> impact. We know that there are, the feds require us to do certain things, but I think Brian's shown a commitment and others to, to get in deep on this and really see what is required and what's not required and where we can move forward. And last, and certainly not least, and I could have spent all eight minutes on this, is educator training, retention, and shift in thinking. We need to have a true commitment to the classroom. Um, as someone said later, let's get rid of the bureaucratic stuff and deal with that. But let, let's teachers teach and, and students learn because that's where it really happens. Educator prep, we can do a better job. We can do a better job at the K-12 level, communicating with the post-secondary folks and what they have in mind, and they can do the same with us. We need quality educators, and we see there's a shortage right now. We also need to face reality of the impact on the profession. So many educators, we could go around the table, we could go around the room, but that's not what we read about. And many of us have had the discussion with our children at the table about becoming teachers, and quite frankly, that's not always so positive. If we're going to be top 10, we need to change that. We need to honor the profession genuinely. Um, and I feel very, very strongly about this. And then, quite frankly, along those lines, we need to make a compensation decision. We need to make sure that we are compensating our teachers at a fair and appropriate salary for the type of work they do 
and then not turn around and advertise it and make them feel guilty about what they do and justify their salaries. I think we need to do all of that to make sure that we continue to have quality educators. Because no offense to anyone, but all of these presentations don't matter if we don't have a quality educator in front of the children in the classroom. So in closing, I want to thank you again. I'm really looking forward to the next steps. I would remind us all that classroom is key, and that goes back to that capitalized word of instruction. And I apologize, but not really. Resources are mandatory. And I'm not saying throw more money at it yet, but let's come up with a strategic plan where we justify the funding and it's appropriate for all. I would recommend a Blue Ribbon Committee, and although not everyone agreed with the outcome, this was done very successfully in the Detroit community. And I was fortunate to sit on that group, which quite frankly had very diverse views, but they came out as one voice, and I was very impressed. I think we can do the same thing. Um, no deja vu, please. I don't want to be here five years from now doing this again. <laughs> uh, I think the time is appropriate and really our children's future. And I want you to know that you have the full support from MASA. We want to be a very strong association to be at the table and be a part of this change. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I think you set a record. You got it done before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, lost your voice, Chris. All right, next up is Bill Miller from Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators. Bill? Well, thank you for this opportunity today to speak with you about four big ideas from the perspective of, of ISD leadership in the state. And so we're going to take a road trip today. Um, unlike a random solution, uh, which I call good luck if you try to implement any one solution, we're going to try to follow a path that leads to a coherent and aligned strategy that's used in uh, successful states and internationally. So I'm just going to sort of lead you through this sort of winding path, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about four big ideas along the way. The first one, obviously, is we need to focus on the students and their education. You've heard plenty about Start School Ready to Learn. ISDs are very proud to be the implementers of GSRP programs. We do believe in three-year-old programs. We do believe in home visiting to enhance language, early language. We, b we believe in providing students the help they need before they fail. We have strategies to do that, like multi-tiered systems of support and instructional consultation. We can no longer use the old system, which is let the students get far behind, then refer them for evaluation and see if they qualify for special education. That has to stop. Raise the bar, close the gap. The biggest single factor in student achievement is the expectations of the people around them. We need to raise expectations for all kids. That sometimes means raising standards. But if we put the first three things together, get them the help they need, start school ready to learn, and raise the expectations, we'll close the achievement gap. Here's the new, I don't think we have to wait and look at the same system. We've now got, through the ISDs and the Technology Readiness Infrastructure Grant, we will have the data and technology we need to customize learning for every student. So we'll be able to accelerate college and career and technical education. And what I mean by that is we should not wait for students to graduate from high school to get the credentials, to get the certifications, and to get the college credits that, that are available to them. We don't expect enough. We can accelerate this process. And finally, to curb the extensive use of standardized testing and the over-reliance on the results. We don't, these tests are not up to the challenge that we're using them for. We should have standardized testing. It should be used rarely. It should be used at transition points, maybe three times in the student's career. We should have a huge focus on formative assessment and also international benchmarking, which, which can be done through uh, through random sampling, so not every student would have to take the international benchmark. But if we're going to be world class, we have to know where we stand against the brightest minds and the best systems in the world. The second big idea is teaching and leading. You've heard a lot about that. Um, every successful nation invests in high quality teacher preparation and professional development. Most high uh, performing nations and states are very selective uh, about their pe teacher preparation programs and who gets into them. We are not. And they also provide time for embedded professional development in, in the, in the workday of the teachers, and we generally do not. Statewide, we should look at standardized teacher and administrator preparation programs to assure quality. 
adopt a professionalized career ladder system for teachers, for novice practicing and master teachers so they can be compensated appropriately and stay in the profession. We need teachers to stay teaching students, which we don't incent that now. And so we really need to have the best teachers in the classroom. And finally, we would advocate for differentiated compensation systems and incentives to retain and tech uh, talent, particularly in communities where there's underprivileged populations and, and high levels of poverty. We need our best people in those teaching situations. Our third big idea is equity. You've heard a lot about that. Uh, I'm just going to say a couple of different things about it. Define a high quality education and ensure every student has access to that education. That's a systemic school reform goal. To me, that means we have to define a common curriculum. What, what experience should every student in the state of Michigan get? What are those experiences? Do they include art and music and phys ed? Do they include all of the content areas? If they do, then that's part of the adequacy study. Adequacy in programs as important as let's see what it takes to fund the current program, which doesn't contain that kind of common experience for all kids. Um, and of course, that takes resources, as has already been said. And there certainly needs to be in the adequacy study consideration so that the funding reflects the cost of educating high need students. And also that funding for school facilities should be addressed somewhere in state policy. We're one of the few states that has no uh, process for inadequate school buildings being upgraded. Again, that's all part of the experience that the students have. They really need to have adequate access to facilities. I'm not saying Cadillac facilities, I'm saying at least an ability to uh, raise some funding locally or otherwise for uh, substandard, substandard facilities. And also to en develop enhanced regional services to assure access to core services for all. And what I mean by that is all, every student should have access to career and technical programs, early college experiences, high levels of technology. And frankly, we have gaps in the state where they don't even have a community college access and where the kids have access to none of those things. So we need, do need to develop a regional plan to assure that. And the fourth big idea is what I call public confidence. This is sort of a governance idea, but I think it's the basic value system that we need to hold in Michigan uh, to define our public schools, that we provide safe, healthy, and nurturing environments that includes high levels of student engagement, that we tend to diversity issues to assure that all schools and families are respected, welcomed, and included, and that we change the conversation about public education through the use of social media and mass media. And that to me means that the public schools are one of the pillars of our democracy. Without the public school system, we would have no functioning democracy. Mm -hmm. And increasing our value, which everybody's talked about here, by putting out an improved uh, student performance, but also uplifting our profession by changing that conversation in public confidence. Uh, so if we follow that road, and again, these are interconnected ideas, so you can't just attack one of these and expect the system to change. They all have to be um, part of a road, part of a road map and a plan uh, to move along so that you could become ultimately, if we follow this, we will be in the top 10 within 10. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill, for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Next up, uh, we have Mark McWilliams, Michigan Protection and Advocacy Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Thanks for inviting. Thanks for inviting me. Somehow, I, I got the feeling I got the my card got into the wrong stack, and I wound up here <laughs> with all these really powerful and smart people. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do my best to try to fit in. Um, uh, and I have written comments. I'm happy to share those with you uh, when we're finished. So um, you have heard a lot. Um, well, let me tell you where we're from first. Um, uh, I'm the Director of Public Policy and Media Relations at Michigan Protection and Advocacy Service. Um, M MPAS is the uh, designated protection and advocacy agency serving people with disabilities in Michigan. Uh, we serve thousands of people with disabilities. Uh, about um, about 25 percent of our caseload uh, relates uh, to education issues and special education in particular. Um, so we, we talk to a lot of people, a lot of parents, a lot of uh, people with disabilities, and, um, 
and give them information about disability related rights and about education. So um, that's what we do. You have heard a lot and thank you for listening to all the, all, all the information that you've been getting, you've been getting from folks. Um, you've been hearing a lot about uh, standards and st assessments and, and you know, rigorous uh, expectations and we certainly agree with all those things. Uh, we, we believe uh, that people and children and youth with disabilities need to be included among those folks um, who are subjected to high standards and high expectations that get good instruction, that get uh, curriculum uh, that is aligned with standards and, and such. Um, but none of that matters ultimately if kids are not in school. And the experience that we have and the experience that I want to tell you a little bit about in, in my short time is, um, is what to do about kids who are not in school. And I'm going to give you an example of a small group of people, a small group of students in Michigan, about 11,000 students who are labeled as having the disability of emotional impairment. Uh, it is one of the 13 categories of eligibility for special education services. Um, it is usually some kind of manifestation of disability related behavior and, um, and as a result uh, people have the, the label of emotional impairment and get special education services. Right. Um, so how do those kids do in school? Um, in, 2012, in, in 2012 in Michigan the dropout rate for all students was about 3.3%. Um, the dropout rate for students with disabilities at about the same time was about 20.2%. Uh, the dropout rate for students with emotional impairment uh, was about 38.1%. All right, um, and these are kids who are bright kids, uh, many of them. These are not children who qualify for special education because they have academic uh, or cognitive issues. Um, these are kids who are bright and can learn uh, and really can do well in school given the right supports. Um, put another way, um, nationally in 2012, uh, a student with emotional impairment was about four times more likely to be expelled or suspended from school than a student without a disability or with, with any other disability, with any other disability, um, and about three times more likely to be subjected <coughs> to in-school suspension or some other kind of discipline um, than a, an, any other student with a disability. There was a study that was done in 2011. Uh, by Texas A&M University and uh, they uh, they looked at the records of over a million Texas school children uh, court records and uh, school records they said they found that in the study that 90 percent over 90 percent of students with emotional impairments had been uh, had been disciplined at least once 90 percent of them uh, that 48 percent had been disciplined uh, 11 or more times in their school careers and that when you were able to control everything else put together, when you're able to control uh, every other factor, including race, uh, economic disparities, geography, et cetera, that a student with an emotional impairment was 23% was more likely to be disciplined than another student. Okay, so um, we also have data. Um, we uh, get about, uh, about seven or 8,000 calls a year about um, uh, we, about 25 percent of those relate to education and many of those are from parents whose kids are having challenging disability related behavior um, so um, the um, <clears throat> the data we have we survey all of our callers and uh, we have found that in asking them questions like um, um, has your kid been suspended expelled restrained uh, has the policeman has the policeman called those kinds of issues that about 40% of the people surveyed, uh, hundreds of people indicate that they are called uh, to pick their kids up early or to keep their kids home for some kind of behavior related issue. Not something that you will see data on uh, very easily, um, but something that we hear about on a day to day basis. Uh, so even for kids who are not officially or formally suspended or expelled, children who are not formally put into in school suspension where the, that number is counted somewhere, this is a big problem as well where children are being removed from instruction uh, at a significant rate. So why should you care about these kids? After all, it's only 11,000 and you want to know how to improve the entire school system in 10 years. Well, I would say that there are three reasons why you should care about them. One, it's the right thing to do. Uh, in 2000, uh, 2005, this board adopted a policy and vision statement on universal education. 
all right? And that policy on universal education found that every child needed an opportunity to have an educational community, everyone, uh, and a wide range of, of students who were historically marginalized or diff having difficulty in the school system, all right? That policy is still good. That's still good, that's still good philosophy now. And many of you were here when that policy was, was adopted. Um, the second reason is, is it makes economic sense. Um, what would you think if the foundation grant, the foundation allowance for a student was $28,000 a student per year? All right, you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of money. All right, that is what it costs to uh, serve one incarcerated person in Michigan uh, every year. According to the Vera Foundation, we have, uh, we do work with prisoners on occasion, and the, uh, the, and the work that we do has one uh, common denominator, and that is that most of the people we talk to were kicked out of school at an early age. All right, those are folks who are in prison. It happens a lot. It's, that's one thing that almost all of them have in common. Um, but the third thing, and I guess this is really the, the reason why I wanted to talk about this today, this particular issue, is that, that when you focus on the needs of the most vulnerable children and you provide the supports, research-based supports for behavior, research-based supports uh, for learning supports, for those kids, that you make your schools better because all kids benefit. There's research, there's uh, information in my written testimony uh, from, a, from Dr. Wayne Saylor, who now teaches at the University of Kansas. And he says that, you know, citing the research they did in the Ravenswood School District in Washington, D.C. and Kansas City, that if you, if you focus your energies and you improve services for the vulnerable students and you apply some of the learning that you have from special education and from other kinds of supports, that it has benefits for everyone and that your schools in general get better. So, um, what do we suggest? Uh, well, I'm a lawyer, okay, so of course everything looks to me like it's a legal problem. Um, that's the heart of my income, as my contracts professor told me once. Um, so, here's what I suggest. Uh, here's what our agency suggests. One, make, a, make, make education a right in Michigan. It's not a right. Uh, parents have to send their kids to school, but the school does not have to take them. Um, and uh, it's too easy. It, it, it is too easy to just send kids home. All right. I'm not a teacher, and I have I love teachers, and they are magicians in my view. That they the the kind of work that they do, and it's very very hard what they do. Um, but it's but if we allow if we allow ourselves to just say, well, we're going to send you away, we're we're going to send you out of school, put you somewhere else, then that that's too easy, and it's not going to it's not going to help those kids. Second. Um, Adopt, adopt research-based educational, educational methodology on school-wide behavior supports as an enforceable methodology in Michigan. It's a best practice. It has been for years. Uh, it, let's, let's enforce it and, and hold people to that standard. Right? Third, reform discipline laws that will make, make it too common for people to be pushed out of school and into somewhere else. There really is no such thing as a way. They're going to be somewhere. All right? And fourth, Look at financing uh, incentives to make sure that community supports, such as mental health services and other social services, are provided and available in the school sites where kids are, uh, so those supports can be added to what schools provide. Um, that's, what, that's what we believe. Um, I want to thank you. It's been an honor and a privilege to have eight minutes in front of you, and, um, and thank you again. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, look at there. Perfect <laughs> Way to go. Thanks a lot, Mark, for being here and sharing. And if you can just leave those, yep, we'll get them. Next up, we have Sandra York, the Executive Director of the Michigan PTA. Sandra? Richard. Oh. I do have very long arms. Oh, no. Okay. Don't worry. Sandy News. <laughs> Um, I will pass, oh, <laughs> kind of short, so <laughs> let me scooch back in here. Um, I will pass those along. I'm not going to say that I'm going to follow my PowerPoint, or excuse my handout, which is why I didn't do it as a PowerPoint exactly in the order that it is. But thank you. Uh, I'm the Executive Director for the Michigan Parent Teacher Association, and I'm going to really focus on a couple of issues that maybe are strategies that might be less visited here. I, I've heard many of the presentations, read other ones, and I think there's not a lot 
broadly speaking, that Michigan PTA would disagree with. We have a lot to go on. Uh, tools and strategies to me are two different things. And so I, I come in on some underlying premises, I guess. One is Michigan PTA's belief in the value of a strong public education system, not for your child, the children on your block or in your school, but for every child in the state and every child in the country. Um, in Michigan has neglected to keep up with the times. It's not the only state. But we need to stop chipping away at our public education system and start rehabilitating it. Um, systemic change requires a shift in thinking. That's going to make some people very uncomfortable. Some of our associations, some of our statewide organizations are going to have to look at things differently. And that doesn't mean they have to disappear. It means they need to perhaps redefine. Um, we need everyone on board. Um, and we're going to need to stay the course. We need to allow adequate time for the change that we put in place. How many times have we seen districts fail over and over again because every time you turn around they're doing something dis different? A state is no different than that. Now, that said, we have some really good news because Michigan has already begun on this path. Um, Michigan's career and college, re college ready standards. Michigan PTA is a strong supporter, has been a strong supporter of the Common Core State Standards since they were started. Um, the new assessments, we are on the right path there. They need to be aligned to these standards. They need to be much more rigorous and they need to be designed to inform <coughs> instruction. Not to create test anxiety and not to penalize teachers. Um, and the foundation is a place for a solid <laughs> educator evaluation system. We're not quite there. I'm not going to talk a lot about that. There are people far more equipped to have that conversation. Um, first strategy I'd like to talk about is involving family, school, and community. PTA has national standards for family school partnerships. There are six standards. And uh, they speak to many of the issues that are dealt with in schools, school districts, and communities. The first standard is welcoming all families. We have diverse communities in schools. We have challenged um, families in schools. When everybody is welcomed into the school community uh, and they participate in the life of the school, you are going to have better education taking place. Standard two is communicating effectively. This is a two-way street. Educator to parent, parent to educator. These need to be meaningful communications. Standard three, supporting student success. Um, the entire family and school community needs to be working together for the educational development and the healthy development of students in general. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the ch challenges. A lot of people have probably already spoken about those. But there are opportunities for school and families to work together to strengthen the knowledge and skills um, for students to learn effectively. Standard four, speaking up for every child. Those of you who know PTA know we were born in advocacy. We were not born as the bake sale moms. We were not born just to sit around and chit chat, although that social part of it was huge then, it still is now. Um, but families need to be empowered to speak up on behalf of children. Every child in that school that isn't receiving what it needs. Um, and standard five, sharing power. Schools, communities, uh, and uh, families sharing the power within the school, working together to maximize what happens. Um, standard six, collaborating with community. Uh, I'm going to just move right past that because I'm very cognizant of the time. Strategy two, a lot of people have talked about this, so I'm going to be quick here. We have to address poverty, social, emotional, and well-being. Um, everything is not equal for <laughs> students. Not all children arrive at school equally. Not all children have adequate adult support at home. Many families are faced with challenges that we can't even comprehend. Um, mental health, um, losing children to violence imposed or self-inflicted is unacceptable. And poverty, the impact is staggering, absolutely staggering. Ray Tellman spoke to that with statistics, and I, I'm not going to spend time there. The mental health one, I probably should earlier on, in we've already begun, put okay to say there. We need to have that program out there. Children need to know there is some place they can call if anything threatens them. 
themselves or somebody else. Strategy three, I, I don't know um, if there's been much conversation about this. Student-centered education, we're missing the boat. Um, some places, not everywhere. But students need to learn to welcome tests as a way to evaluate their progress and set goals. It's done in other countries, it's done in some programs, it is very doable. Students should be used as mentors and a support network for other students within the school. Again, this is done some places, but it's not done broadly. And students should be involved in areas of school planning. They need to be able to take ownership of their own school and their own education. Strategy four, respecting our educators. Um, using educator evaluations as a means to inform professional development and actually having professional development available to our educators. Uh, we could take it back to our system of um, training teachers. Um, I, I'm not going to really go into that. Using assessment results as a means to guide student learning rather than as a means to penalize our educators. A great teacher may have a class that is very challenged this year. A challenged teacher may have an amazing class. It, it all gets tossed up in the air based on the kids that end up in that classroom and, and where their life is at and everything else that's involved. Um, using experienced teachers as mentors, I know that, that is talked about a lot. I absolutely believe that is key. Teachers need to be able to observe each other and critique each other. Critique should be a positive word. It shouldn't make educators shake in their boots because somebody is coming in to watch them. Mm -hmm. um, some closing thoughts. It is our ethical obligation to all children in Michigan to provide them an education that will maximize their options in life. Um, I think it's what makes this nation great. I, as somebody just spoke to that and, I, and, and we really have to keep that in the forefront of our mind. We're, I mean, we can't go much further down right now. And we have some great things in place. That's the bizarre point. Um, redesigning Michigan's education system is a significant task, but it is a very, but it's not impossible. Other states have been successful, we can too. And I believe that Michigan has an outstanding and committed group of educational, community, and business leaders that believe we can be a top 10 state, which means we can do this. Many of them are sitting in this room. Many of them are colleagues that I work with other places. And I thank you for your time, and I thank you for bringing this forward for all of us to share our thoughts and look forward to working with everybody to see what we can do. Oh, you. Just shut me up, didn't you? <laughs> no, 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 we're not doing that. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, you for being here and sharing your voice. Next, we have uh, Jeff from Public Sector Consultants. Should have given you all a backpack today. Yes. <laughs> really. Please take the reports. I don't want to carry them back. <laughs> Go ahead and get started, Jeff. While we're passing that out, it's okay. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Gilfoyle. I'm a vice president of public sector consultants. Uh, I'm here today to talk about a research report we recently published. There are copies over there for anybody who wants one. Uh, research we did for the Council of Michigan Foundations and the Steelcase Foundation on ways to improve uh, the education system in Michigan. So we had three goals with this research. Uh, the first was to examine how Michigan was doing in K-12 and, and see if we agreed with uh, statements that were said that performance has been declining in the state. Uh, second, if Michigan's performance has been declining, investigate why. And third, make recommendations for how to improve the system. Uh, we did find that uh, Michigan's K-12 performance was declining. I'll talk very briefly about why, but I'm going to focus my time on the recommendations to improve the system. But those other items are addressed fully in the report. So we find that the reason for the state's poor performance is most likely the bad economic times we went through from fiscal year 2000 to 2012. And that impacted the K-12 system in two primary ways. First, we saw a dramatic increase in poverty in the state. The percentage of our state's families that are in poverty went from 10% to 17% over that period, which was the largest increase uh, of any state. And poverty and education performance are highly correlated. Uh, second, the bad economy had a really significant 
fiscal impact on our schools and that fiscal pressure is hurting performance. Uh, just to give you uh, a, a brief example of that, if Michigan's economy <coughs> had grown at the same rate as the nation's from fiscal year 2000 to 2012 and we had the same tax rates that we have right now, the state would raise about $9 billion more a year in state and local taxes with the same tax rates. That comes out to about $2,500 $2, a pupil if you were to translate that into K-12 terms. So we, when we looked at this, we identified four areas that we think are the places for the state to focus, and I'll talk about those briefly. We also go through in the paper a lot of the recent reforms that have been enacted in K-12 in Michigan, and we think there have been a lot of good reforms that have been enacted, but I think it's hard for the average citizen to see how they fit into the broader vision of how we do K-12 in Michigan, and we think it's very important that the state lays out a strategic vision of how we're trying to improve K-12 so that people can see how individual policies fit into that vision. So when we think about what that looks like, we have four building blocks. Um, the first is early investment, uh, focus on teaching, spending our resources efficiently, and connecting post-secondary. Uh, we talk in the report about what we've done in each of those areas, and we also talk about what we should do next. I'm going to skip the what we've done already and focus on the what we should do next. So early investment, you've heard several people talk about the importance of that today. Uh, we think it's critical to invest in evidence-based programs. Michigan has obviously made significant progress uh, in recent years with the expansion of the Great Start Readiness Program. Uh, we think finding other evidence-based programs uh, to invest in is the way to go. Um, in some other recent research we've done, we've identified four home visiting, access to medical homes, high quality child care, and preschool for three-year-olds as good places for the state to consider future investment. We also think it's critical to build out the evaluation infrastructure and track our progress. If we're going to put more resources into early childhood, then it's very important that we can see where it's working. Um, and we want to recommend extending the longitudinal data system to early childhood programs. This is already underway. Putting in place a universal kindergarten entry assessment so that we can evaluate if our students are arriving uh, at school uh, on track and ready to succeed. Uh, we think it's important to have a focus on teaching. Um, right at the end of the day, it's the teachers who are teaching the students in the classroom, so this is the most important of the areas. Um, we identify three policies uh, that we think the state should do in the first one. The first is enact teacher legislation. Uh, Michigan has already done extensive work in this area. Um, we've evaluated tools. Um, we've piloted them. We just can't seem to get to the last step of enacting the legislation, so we think it's really important that the state do that. Uh, second, we think we need to provide more support for teachers teaching new standards. We think it's good that the state has adopted the Common Core, and the Common Core is very important, but most of the support has been provided at the local level, and as a result of that, there's a significant amount of variance across the state in how well it's been implemented. And if we want to be successful with these new standards, we need to ensure that all teachers have access to high-quality support to teach the new standards. Mm -hmm. And finally, we need to provide more opportunities for teacher leaders to become involved in policy formation in the state and to support the implementation of that policy. Uh, we wouldn't reform uh, medicine in the state without involving doctors, and we shouldn't reform teaching in the state without uh, involving teachers. Um, we think it's very important that the state spend its limited resources efficiently. As I've noted, we have tremendous fiscal pressure on the schools, and so since there's not a lot of money in the system, we need to make sure that the dollars go where the costs are. So in particular, we think that the finance formulas need to be revisited in a couple of places. Uh, first, we should address declining enrollment. Our formulas don't work well with declining enrollment. We should allocate more funding to students that uh, represent more cost, at-risk students, English as a second language. And we should enhance the formulas um, to make more choice options readily available uh, so that schools don't feel penalized if they have their students going into community colleges or middle colleges. The formula should work well to support those kind of options. We think we should connect post-secondary better. This is just expanding um, middle colleges, uh, expanding dual enrollment opportunities. And we also think that a number of students are graduating without a clear plan as to what to do next. Michigan has the fifth worst ratio of uh, counselors to the number of students. Uh, we think that if we're going to be a top state, that's not going to work. And we recommend in the report trying to move towards the national average. Over the longer term, we think it's important to put strategy in place. Um, we identify some of them here for the four building blocks. So, for example, under early investment, we need to coordinate programs across agencies to ensure that every child arrives at kindergarten healthy and ready to learn. On the teaching front, we think that we need to develop a comprehensive strategy to recruit, prepare, support, pay, and retain highly effective teachers so that all students have access to effective instruction and support. Um, with the formulas, we need to target the resources to students we know have the highest needs and programs we know work so Michigan can get the most out of our education investment. 
And on the post-secondary front, we need to help all students identify their future goals and achieve them so more Michiganders are leaving high school prepared to tackle career and college. Finally, we think that as a state, we need to be more aspirational, and I think it's great that we're talking about being a top 10 state. I think that's a good goal for the state, and it's achievable. But given the path that we're on right now, where the state has been one of only six states that have declined and we're a bottom 15 state, um, and when you look at performance, if you're going to uh, be a top 10 state, you need to do stuff that's transformational, and we need to start thinking in a more transformational way. Um, a lot of the policies that we talk about will make a significant improvement, but it's not going to move us to be a top 10 state. So if we really want to be a top 10 state, I mean, it's like saying you want to go to the moon, right? You, you really need to change what you're doing to make that happen. And if we really want to be a top 10 state in, in Michigan, and I think we really do want to be a top 10 state, then I think we need to think about things differently and start thinking about policies that are truly transformative for the system and for our students. Um, so thank you very much. And again, for people who are here, there are copies of the report in the box. Please take them. I don't want to carry them back to the office. <laughs> really Let's give you Jeff. Board, thank Let's you help Jeff and take those reports so he doesn't have to carry them home. I very much appreciate your time today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you, you for being here and sharing your vision. Yep. Thank you very much for being here. Next up, Citizens <laughs> Research Council. Craig? clock should help me with my fantasy football draft later this week. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to go? Good afternoon, State Board of Education President Austin, members of the State Board of Ed, and Superintendent Whiston. Uh, congratulations on your new role here. I understand that your interest today lies in a very specific question. What must be done for Michigan to become a top 10 performing state in 10 years? Well, CRC has a long history of conducting nonpartisan, objective public affairs research on K-12 education issues. Our research is used by state policymakers, school officials, and other decision makers. And while we've not published a specific report on this question, we believe that our background on the matter well qualifies us to uh, shed some light on some recommendations that you should consider. Uh, I'd like to point out that last week we mailed to each of you a listing of our most recent and relevant reports on K-12 education. My remarks today draw heavily from those publications, but in a much more summarized manner. If anyone has questions or needs to uh, explore an issue in more detail, my contact information is at the end of this PowerPoint. I think we all can agree that improving Michigan's educational performance, both in the short run and over the long term, will rely on a well-functioning school finance system. And while money is not the only answer, it certainly plays an important role. Not just the total amount we spend on K-12 education, but how that money is raised and is shared among local schools, school buildings, and school children. Michigan's school funding system is the foundation upon which academic su success is built. Currently, this foundation is not supportive of all children across the state. The system needs to adequately, not just equitably, support all kids, rich, poor, urban, rural, special needs, general education. The Proposal A school finance system functioned quite well in meeting its major uh, policy objectives. During the first half dozen years of existence, it reduced property taxes, narrowed the gap in spending, and um, uh, cut property taxes. However, nobody predicted the economic and demographic changes that Michigan endured during the 2000s. These changes gave rise to a number of challenges for public schools beginning in the early part of the last decade and especially in the latter part. Michigan's current funding system is over 20 years old and our research has shown that Michigan's school funding mechanism, primary funding mechanism, faces a number of challenges and is in need of a tune-up. Additionally, there are other important financial issues that were not part of Proposal A. These were excluded from the reforms adopted in 94. Specifically, I'm talking about special education and school infrastructure. Our recommendations to the board today include directing attention to a couple of these key, key challenges in these areas. We believe it's imperative that the board consider both the financial challenges arising from our 20-year experience of Proposal A, as well as those issues that were excluded from the Prop A reforms. Addressing both will be will be required to strengthen the foundation upon which student success is built for all children over the next 10 years. And I guess one caveat here. Uh, I recognize that this is not the legislature and you don't have the power of the purse, but you do have the constitutional mandate to advise the uh, legislature on financial matters, and I, I suggest uh, you use that. 
Um, the first challenge I want to talk about, and I know others have brought it up, is uh, this challenge with declining student enrollment and how it affects uh, school finances. There's a number of things going on in this chart here. First, statewide school age population is down considerably from 1.7 million students in 2003 to 1.5 million today. At the district level, declining enrollment results from the sh shrinking school age population, but also the competition for students from growing number of uh, school districts, including charter schools. Nearly three-fourths of traditional public school districts experience losses from 13 to 14. And over the longer term, from 20, 2003 to 2012, 23% of districts saw a student decline of more than 25%. So in the early years of Prop A, this was an isolated problem. Today, it is the reality across the state. And why is this a problem? Well, Michigan's system of funding schools places a very high importance on the number of students enrolled. And as you know, the majority of the school funding comes through the foundation grant. And the total amount of foundation dollars that a school gets is a function of that grant, as well as the number of students. Similarly, um, with categorical funding, it's mostly distributed on a per pupil basis uh, at risk. And so when the number of students declines, the aggregate number of dollars decline. So the system's set up so money follows the child. However, in a declining enrollment environment, we actually find that while the foundation grant goes with the child to the other provider, uh, many of the costs remain with the school district. This dynamic can create a financial challenge, especially in the short run for those districts losing students as they try to bring their costs into alignment with revenue. Districts must ad address the declining enrollment through spending decisions. They don't have the authority to raise local revenues. And if they don't do this in a timely fashion, they experience fiscal stress, which unfortunately could possibly lead to a deficit. So part of the challenge of managing down, at least from the financial perspective, is uh, how the grant foundation grant is structured. It's intended to represent the, the average cost of educating a student, not the marginal cost. So when each student leaves, the costs don't decrease um, in lockstep. And so uh, managing down is, is a serious challenge. Um, the state had strategies to help districts deal with this, uh, but over the years, those, those uh, additional resources to help that transition have been eliminated from the budget. Um, uh, this uh, declining enrollment, we think, uh, can lead to a death spiral in which uh, more students leave, more resources are uh, taken out of the system, at least the district and um, programming gets affected the quality and that is then a feedback to more students leaving. So my recommendations are establish a policy for early warning system to deal with uh, this death spiral scenario. Uh, this is a short term uh, policy and I know there's some steps uh, towards this right now with some early warning legislation that's passed and signed by the governor. Uh, restore the strategies uh, designed to ease the negative effects of uh, declining enrollment. And then long term re-examine the structure of the per pupil foundation grant. Um, talk, look at the, what, what the grant is intended to uh, represent uh, fixed costs and, and variable costs and differences in costs between uh, grades and student characteristics. Um, the second problem I want to look at here is um, special ed. We spend a lot of money here, the second uh, most amount of money uh, outside of the foundation grant. About 13 percent of our students have individualized education plans. And again, this is an item that really wasn't addressed in the Proposal A uh, reforms. And we found in our research a considerable variation on a per pupil basis uh, between a low of about 9000 per student to a high of about $19,000 per student. Statewide, the average is right around $14,000. And what we found is that the gap in per pupil spending has been widening, whereas it's been shrinking with general ed uh, funding, it's increasing with um, special ed. So this problem isn't getting uh, better with age. In fact, it's getting, it's getting worse. So uh, our recommendations uh, for dealing with the special ed challenges are to reduce the reliance on the local property tax. We found that this is the primary contributor to those spending variations. And uh, this was uh, something that wasn't addressed during Proposal A, as, as you recall, when we moved from uh, local property tax to state taxes for general ed, we re retained the local property tax as a funding mechanism for special ed. Uh, our recommendation talks about uh, greater uh, centralization of funding decisions, moving them from the local level to the state level. And if we're going to do this, we're probably going to have to invest more money because we're, it's going to be difficult, at least politically, to reduce the higher spending uh, 
uh, areas of the state to, to a median or uh, average <coughs> area, uh, amount of spending per state. So raising the bottom is probably the, the proper um, approach to this. Um, I want to quickly go through our uh, financing uh, school infrastructure if I can. Another forgotten piece of <laughs> Proposal A. Again, we have found uh, considerable uh, variation across uh, school districts in terms of both the uh, capital investment uh, in uh, school infrastructure as well as the need. And um, just to give you uh, the, the, the uh, Reader's Digest version, the, the poorer districts in the state have less capital investment per student um, and greater need, and the wealthier districts in the, in the state have uh, more capital investment and less need. Um, these stark differences, again, exist primarily because of the way we fund uh, capital investment. We left this to uh, the local decisions, and while we respect uh, the desires of local communities to have the, the greatest and uh, most modern uh, school infrastructure facilities, um, technology, sports fields, we also acknowledge that there's an equity issue and that all students should be entitled to uh, adequate capital infrastructure in their school districts. So our proposal here, uh, similar uh, along the lines to the special ed uh, recommendations are to address the adequacy as well as the equity in school uh, capital funding. Uh, to do this, we need to reduce the reliance on the local property tax as the primary funding source, uh, move funding decisions to the, to the state level. And, um, and we had uh, in a report that we did uh, five recommendations uh, for greater state involvement, uh, everything ranging from state grants to full assumption, uh, state full assumption of school facility financing. So I want to thank you for your time, and my contact information is here at the end of the PowerPoint. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. Next up is Michigan Association of Public School Academies, Dan Sittenberry. Oh, I saw Dan. Yep. Yeah, all right. There he is. Thank you, Dan, for being here. I'm Dean Quisenberry, the president of the Michigan Association of Public School Academies. So uh, thank you, President Austin and Superintendent Whiston and members of the state board for inviting this conversation <coughs> on how to make Michigan a top 10 state. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to speak to that. Uh, obviously, asking the question, uh, gives us all an understanding that Michigan isn't a top 10 state, so that's a healthy recognition. I heard the state superintendent saying so on the radio this morning, and that's a good place to start. The other thing uh, that's important is kind of the obvious also is uh, the fact that you're bringing together lots of ideas, to try to create a plan, aligning that with other stakeholders is also a very good idea. Uh, we, we took the opportunity over the last 30 days to check in with our uh, 305 schools and all the people involved in them, and people are willing to work hard. They do want uh, some coherence, some strategy, some uh, consistency amongst all the different uh, education stakeholders. So having a plan is a good thing to be part of a plan, if that makes sense. Um, we also believe as charter schools, there's uh, basically four principles that uh, when we created charter schools in Michigan <coughs> 20 years ago, were really a key part of that. Uh, it is uh, academic accountability versus regulation. It's funding on a per pupil basis. It's empowering parents with choice. And it's empowering educators with autonomy at the building level. So we think how we go about doing some of the things that you might recommend uh, as a state plan <coughs> is as important as what you recommend. What that means is uh, we believe, uh, as one example is being discussed today in the legislature, or these days in the legislature, teacher evaluation, um, we believe that's a great idea. Please don't tell us how to do it. Uh, hold us accountable for academic outcomes and make sure that we're doing the things that are necessary in the way that's best for those schools and for the students in those schools. So how is an important strategy to pursue, if that makes sense? Give power to educators in their buildings across this great state to implement the things <coughs> that they know they need to do for kids. That would be the first point we'd recommend. Um, I passed out uh, a list of uh, recommendations. I'll just highlight those quickly. Um, 
achieving equitable oh. funding would be the first recommendation. John, I think there are, are you uh, yeah. sitting on these? I didn't <laughs> intend to do that. That's right. I'm not trying to quash your recommendation. That's right. <laughs> Narrowing the equity gap to fund each child in, a, uh, in, in the state equitably. We, we believe in that. It's way, uh, part of what charter schools were uh, help create charter schools and then focusing the funding on the individual student as opposed to programs or geography or how a uh, education is delivered is, is critical. So uh, we believe equitable means uh, differentiating for things like special needs, poverty, but not for the way schools delivered um, or where they are from or the type of kid you're talking about or the, or the actual student where they live. Um, establish a new academic accountability system. Uh, we really believe strongly that we need to create a 21st century accountability system in Michigan that, that shows both growth and proficiency. Um, a system like this obviously is very complicated, but I'm going to highlight a few key things. It would be transparent and easy for not only schools, but parents to understand the community. So you looked at it, everyone understood what it meant and how to calculate it to some degree. Um, that uh, you would uh, hold schools accountable for their results and that includes consequences, closing bad schools, intervening in them. Uh, we've been kind of lax in doing that in Michigan. Uh, we believe that even for the charter schools in the state, in fact, we would make a very charter-specific recommendation, uh, kind of a unique circumstance with uh, authorizers. We would uh, uh, disqualify sc charter schools that are low performing from shopping for a new authorizer. Uh, so that's something we would certainly be supportive of and have been in the past and would be uh, in the creation of a new system. We also think it's important to create a culture of innovation. Um, a couple specific things that we mean by that is removing unnecessary mandates or barriers that hinder schools from operating a program that meets the goals established in their charter contracts or the, the accountability that uh, the performance expectations you have, we all have for schools. Things like seat time, common calendars, um, yeah, even controversial at this moment, this day. Uh, why are we waiting until after Labor Day to start education when a lot of kids need uh, something more than that? Um, allowing the use of recognized experts as part-time, maybe non-certified tenure, it's a talent issue. There's a talent problem in Michigan right now, both in terms of uh, availability and alignment, and we want to make it easier to get really highly talented people with appropriate training and background into the classroom. Those are ideas around innovation. And then quality school facilities and easily access. There, there's more and more uh, circumstances around the state where you have a very uh, usable facility that's been paid for already by taxpayers and is not being used as an educational facility. And uh, there are people, whether it's a charter school or maybe other districts, that could still utilize those facilities and offer that community, that neighborhood, that area education through that facility. So we shouldn't be. Uh, demolishing them or reselling them we should be utilizing them as educational uh, facilities but I went through those quickly we like to be simple and precise and these uh, are ideas that uh, um, we have been promoting uh, we did verify them again with our members just recently we got a very good response you've got the engagement of educators across the state and uh, these these are the recommendations they made in the order they were making them so uh, we feel good about that as well. But thank you for this opportunity and the chance to do this. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for being here and sharing your recommendations with us. Appreciate it. Our last two speakers have chosen to speak together. Uh, so they are from the Michigan Education Association, Steve Cook, and from AFT Michigan, Dave Hecker. So we invite them to come forward. Good afternoon, uh, President Austin, full board, superintendent, uh, as with the other speakers. We thank you very much uh, for the opportunity uh, to address you, and we really applaud your patience in, uh, in sitting through and digesting the ideas put forth. My name is David Hecker. I'm president of AFT Michigan. And I'm Steve Cook, president of the Michigan Education Association. And uh, with David, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, between our two unions, we represent nearly 175,000 professionals who are on the front lines of public education every day, teachers, support staff, higher education faculty and staff, school retirees and student teachers. We are proud to be a voice for all those who are dedicated to working with our students. And that's why we wanted to present jointly to you today, to share our members' combined vision for what we will 
for what will make Michigan's public schools great for all Michigan students. First and foremost, if Michigan is to gain to again become a leader in education, we need education policymakers to make a fairly simple commitment. Agree on what you want taught in Michigan and to Michigan's children. Then provide us the training and resources and time so that we can make that happen. And finally, hold us accountable as professionals for following through on those decisions over time. When other groups speak about coherence, that is what it means to our members. For the past decade or more, educators, students, and schools have experienced a continuous roller coaster ride of changing policies, changing expectations, and changing learning environments. As soon as we begin to adapt to one set of rules and decisions, another set of conflicting ones appear. Educators cannot help but feel a little like Charlie Brown trying to kick the football, only to have it yanked away from us. If we're to move forward as a state with great schools, it is imperative that policymakers understand that no one in the system, not the educators, not the administrators, and especially not the students, can succeed if there isn't coherence in decision making and if there is not time to let those decisions take effect. Other high performing states like Massachusetts don't pull the rug out from underneath teachers, support staff, and principals and superintendents who are trying to do the right thing for students. For an example, look no further than the flurry of movement from the M step to Smarter Balance, uh, from the MEEP to Smarter Balance to M step, from the MME to ACT to SAT. The frustration with all these changes without a cohesive long-term approach extends not just to the members we represent, but to the students and families we all serve. The best ideas for improving education will have no chance of success unless this happens. Next, we need to stop blaming the doctors for the disease. Educators are demoralized. They feel as though they've been blamed and shamed and ostracized. Mm -hmm. Enrollment in teacher preparations institutions has plummeted. If doctors are given no training, no medicine, and no surgical tools, people will die. Yet no one is going to blame the doctor. Teachers are hardworking professionals, many of whom struggle daily under almost impossible conditions. Every day we hear about great teachers who decide they can't take it anymore and choose to leave the profession so that they can go to jobs where they receive better pay and, more importantly, more respect. That respect can be shown by policymakers through another fairly simple action, asking and listening. Ask frontline educators what they need and they'll tell you. But too often that doesn't happen. Please be proactive and reach out for that input on issues like changing standards and assessments. David and I and other union leaders like us have been democratically elected to represent those educators. Not only can we share what we hear from members, but our organizations stand ready to help you hear directly from the teachers and support staff we serve. The professionals employed in Michigan schools are the experts on what students need. Listen to what those experts have to say and encourage them at every turn to speak up. Good things will happen when you do. The input from our members and other stakeholders was central in highlighting the issues with the M-STEP last spring. And because of that, Input, Superintendent Whiston, the department, and this board have made wise, common sense decisions about rolling back some of the testing requirements and time frames for next year. For that, we thank you. It's not only good policy, but it also reinforces for educators that their voice matters, both for their profession and for their students. There are more instances where the advice of those education experts needs to be heeded. Take evaluation, for example. The Ball Commission worked diligently and provided state legislators with an excellent description of what an effective teacher and administrator evaluation system needs to look like, one that supports and develops talent in the classroom. Thanks to the efforts of lawmakers from both parties, a coalition was formed to support evaluation reform that spanned the education community, including many of the groups you've heard from in this process. However, we still have no statewide teacher and administrator evaluation system. We need the legislature to pass fair and effective teacher evaluation reforms. One legislature, one legislator should not be able to stop a bipartisan solution on evaluation <laughs> that can help Michigan teachers teach and students learn. Michigan teachers deserve fair and consistent evaluations that help them grow and develop as educators. 
and those evaluations need to be completed by administrators who are well trained and fair minded in their approach. Evaluation shouldn't be used to punish teachers, but to show them the path to greatness. The frontline experts have also uh, have also made clear suggestions about improving reading proficiency. We know that early success in reading is essential to future academic growth. Without strong reading skills, students will struggle to learn history, math, or science. We need to do more of that earlier to identify students who are struggling with reading by the time they're in third grade. Then we need to focus not only on holding them back, but providing them with the support and interventions to succeed. And those supports can't be there for just one year. They need to follow the child throughout their academic career. Early identification and support is key. And universal pre-K programs are a proven part of how, of how to help students succeed at reading and beyond. Before I turn this over to David, there's a final thought I'd like to share. State policymakers need to think bigger and bolder. Don't be afraid of bold solutions to help big problems. And we can't simply be steered away from those bold <coughs> solutions because of price tags. For example, we can help address teacher shortages and high rates of teacher turnover by offering student loan deferrals or forgiveness plans for those entering Michigan's education professions. We have in our state a superb example of such a bold action that has yielded results, the Kalamazoo Promise. Recent research, recent research shows dramatic improvements in academic success when students know that they will have the financial support to continue their education after high school. Michigan should consider a statewide promise program so that every child, if they work hard and perform academically, can accomplish the dream of a college degree or a vocational certification or other post-secondary attainment. Educators inspire Michigan students every day. Mm -hmm. And those who are at their best use big, bold ideas to make it happen. If we're going to listen to our, edu our expert educators on the front lines and we can't be afraid of their big ideas when our, uh, their big ideas that will inspire our state to have great schools for every student. David. Thank you, Steve. Across the board, one of the common themes you'll hear from educators is the need for stability for educators and for students. Unfortunately, the learning environment for Michigan students has been <coughs> destabilized over the past years. A district's revenue, as you know, changes based on its student enrollment. But having fewer students doesn't necessarily change what's needed to be spent to have a well-rounded curriculum. Constant, there's constant turnover in staff. There are school closings. Classrooms where half the students who started there this morning won't be there by New Year's, let alone June. Combined with the lack of cohesion that Steve described, this all has contributed to systematic instabilities that have adversely impacted learning environments and are obstacles to transforming Michigan's public schools into some of our nation's best. Recent policies like lifting the cap on charter schools, forming the Education uh, Achievement Authority, cyber schools, and an overall remove and replace approach have promised to bring statewide educational improvements but have accelerated this destabilization. Therefore, it's imperative that we change the approach to school reform. To ensure the success of our students, we must ensure that public schools have the resources and are committed to delivering a well-rounded learning experience that nurtures the whole student. Unfortunately, important programs that expose students to the arts, literature, physical education, and multicultural curriculums are often the first to be cut to make way for test prep or in response to budget pressures. We certainly must hold all students to high academic expectations, and we recognize the importance of assessments as teaching tools. But if we allow over-testing to narrow curriculums, we limit our school's ability to develop the type of thinkers and people that will move our state forward. The current corporate model of school reform is not just depriving many of our students of a well-rounded education. It's compromising our state's ability to support a high-quality, equitable public education system for all. Assessments and tests need to be used as diagnostic tools to help educators shape the learning process. Instead, they're used to determine which communities to punish and as justification to hand schools over to private companies. This isn't a solution and it has not been proven to help move our state's public education forward. A system whose primary policy for improving schools is to hand the keys to someone else after a couple of years 
creates the type of system that ignores the root challenges to success, makes cohesion impossible, and creates a transience among students and a churn among educators and administrators. If we're going to improve schools, we need communities to be invested in the process, not turned over or removed and replaced. Invested communities are communities that can participate in making schools better. As Steve mentioned, this means listening to professionals and their unions. We represent their wishes and their needs because, as Steve mentioned, we were democratically elected by those we serve. We should encourage the participation of advisory school leadership teams, of parents, teachers, staff, and the principal, and community members to guide school-level decisions. At the district level, investing in communities also means restoring local autonomy and respecting decision-making in all communities. Reforms that rip schools away from districts and place them under state control or in the hands of organizations or authorizers hundreds of miles away from the school itself not only violate core principles of democracy, they also have not worked. This type of reform model has led to an educational landscape in Detroit and elsewhere where several authorizers have the power to open and close schools on their own without any coordination, leaving some neighborhoods with too few schools, others with too many, and an overall lack of predictable enrollment that makes budgeting and planning nearly impossible. There is no stability. Charter schools are a part of Michigan's public education system, but we need authorizers to be held accountable for improving schools, and we need a coordinated charter system. A step towards a coordinated system would require authorizers had to obtain a quote-unquote certificate of need to open a new charter school ensuring that the opening of a school is adding value to a community's educational landscape. Obviously, I'm critical of the direction that so-called education reform has taken in our state, but I want to make it clear. I am critical of such reforms not because they do not think reform is necessary or that we don't need to improve, but that recent reforms are actually doing more harm to our system and our students than they are moving them forward. So what needs to be done? We need to think big and offer bold solutions like some of the ones Steve offered. But we also need to accurately diagnose what needs to be done to fix and to move our Michigan schools forward. Over the past 15 years, national and state policies have helped to create achievement and opportunity gaps. Closing the gap between those students living in poverty and those who are not is the most important thing we can do to strengthen our public schools for all students. Middle Cities already presented you with a scope of how poverty impacts schooling and gave the charge to fully fund at-risk programs and close the opportunity gap. They are right. We need to address the impact of poverty directly. This means investing in programs that diminish the impact of poverty on the learning environment and in policies that improve the quality of life of families living in poverty. When we hear that service employees, like those who work in fast food restaurants, are fighting for a $15 wage. We need to remember that their fight is connected to addressing poverty and improving the quality of life for their families and their kids. And these are the very kids attending Michigan's public schools. We must, we must continue to focus on how to prepare students for the job market, but we also must make sure that the job market has good jobs with living wages. We have introduced school choice in response to poverty. We have taken over school districts with concentrations of poverty. We flipped schools with concentrations of poverty from operator to operator. And over the past two decades, we have blamed teachers for not being able to teach around poverty. But we haven't, as a state, tried to address the impacts of poverty directly. This is a little like having a hole in a boat that is taking our water slowly. The boat's crew knows exactly where the hole is and that the hole will cause the boat to sink. They also know that they can stop the water by plugging the hole. But instead of dealing with the hole directly, they bail the water and go to high, gr higher ground, trying any creative solution to avoid getting wet instead of just plugging the hole. We need to invest resources in providing wraparound services in schools and start to plug the hole. I'm fortunate to chair Communities and Schools Michigan, which is one of the organizations working to provide essential supports. But to be honest, CIS and other organizations are a band-aid. We need to develop and scale up more comprehensive programs and truly address poverty. Big and bold educational ideas for our state are important moving forward. 
But sometimes we just have to pay attention to what research says, and research is telling us that if we don't address the impact of poverty, we are stunting the ability for kids to succeed. There are certainly schools that have beat the odds and shown growth and achievement despite poverty. These are exceptional stories, and we should celebrate them. But sh we should be working to create a system where kids don't have to depend on outliers or exceptional circumstances to achieve. We should be creating the life and learning conditions so that all kids will succeed. Poverty leads to the instability in many aspects of young persons' lives. We can't continue to allow current reform policies to destabilize our education system. Examining how we can address the root cause of the opportunity gap would make a needed change to how we approach school reform. In closing, let us ask that you listen to educators and provide stability. That's a pretty simple message from the two of us, but it's a powerful one that comes to you straight from the members we represent, our state's educators. I know I speak for Steve and the members of both of our unions when I say we stand ready to work alongside you as partners in making Michigan a top education state once more. Steve and I thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, David, for being here and sharing your thoughts. We are now going to go back to public participation, and I deeply uh, apologize for being so far behind uh, in public comment. Thank you for holding on and being here. Marilyn, uh, do you have some individuals that would like to speak to the board? I do. Um, I've got eight forms here, and if anyone else has one, um, if you could please, I'll come back in a minute here and grab those from you. The first speaker is Elizabeth Bauer, and the second speakers are Bruce and Gina Umstead. And I know Liz Bauer knows the rules of public participation, so while she's coming to the table, I will remind everybody that you are given five minutes to speak. The board does not engage in a back and forth conversation at the board table at this time, but they're happy to hear whatever you've got to say. We'll have the timer running so you can gauge your time. Okay. And looks Thank like you very Liz is much. ready. Superintendent Liston, President Austin, members of the board, it's a pleasure to be with you again this afternoon. I feel sort of, after you've heard 30-some presentations at the last <laughs> meeting and this meeting, I feel like those guys on ESPN who tell you about the game you just watched after, <laughs> you know, they come on and they tell you all the plays and you just saw them. But um, I do want to share some ideas that I have with you about how we can make our state uh, a much better provider of public education to our young people. Uh, we do have some assets going forward. We have high standards. We've adopted the Common Core state standards so we can, you know, compare ourselves to some states in <coughs> terms of reading and math. We've got legislated the Michigan Merit Curriculum for a diploma, so we at least have in place something more than a semester of civics to get graduate in our state. So there's some foundational things. And another foundational thing that we have, which my colleagues on the board when I was on it will remember, <coughs> is the universal education vision and principles. Several of the people earlier today uh, remarked about it. It's the framework and foundation for public policy by the State Board, the Department of Education, local and intermediate school districts. Actually, if you reread it, because it talks about all learners in all of their diversity, which is our challenge, as you've heard. People focus on poverty, they might have focused on English language learners, they could have focused on special education. We have an array of young people from birth to adulthood who are diverse in every aspect of their learning needs, and we have a responsibility to provide each one with an appropriate education. Every kid can learn. Every kid can learn at high levels. We've got to abandon that deficit mentality. I, you know, I fought for 100 years to get special education services, and, and that was my first 100 years of life. And in my second 100 years, I'm wishing I didn't because it focuses on low, you know, can'ts and won'ts instead of will and can and how. So I really don't want to get rid of the entitlement. Don't hear me that way. But, but I do think we need to have aspire higher. And we've had a lot of talk about all the... Um, uh, you know, models, CEOs, and all of that. I submit that the 
only way we're going to be a top 10 state is when our students achieve. And then that boils down to students and their teachers. And so my comments, if you'll look in, in through later at your leisure, uh, we talked first about students. And there, I think the hot thing I want to mention is I think we need to move from course-based, classroom-based instruction to credit attainment where students can work collaboratively in groups toward achievement of the 4,000 standards in the Michigan Merit Curriculum and make projects with artifacts. I'm sorry that Rick Joseph isn't here today because they do work that way at his school. Um, and, and give credit when proficiency is demonstrated in a standard. That way, the gifted kid can work fast as a speeding bullet the kid that needs more time can have more time. No one fails in that model. You can't fail. You can only have more time and get direction. Maria Montessori had it nailed. The second thing is our teachers, and we absolutely have to reform teacher education. I've been working with some colleges in their teacher education divisions. We have to raise the standard of the applicant. We have to mo uh, mentor and, and hold the elbow of that student for four years through college. We, we need to give the future teacher opportunities in a variety of classrooms while, during the four years, rural, urban, two weeks here, two weeks there. Do an impact project, leave an artifact behind, benefit the school you were hosted by, and go away with knowledge and skill. Colorado State University does this, it helps their future teachers decide, I don't want to teach elementary, I am a high school math teacher. Anyway, uh, there are ways we can do that better. I've outlined a lot of samples, I've given examples, I've given you some websites in here. I hope you'll take time to read it. I thank you for your attention. And use this as a lens to vet every proposal that comes out of the governor's office or our legislature for how to reform schools. If it doesn't measure up to the universal education, then ask them for another proposal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for hanging out. Our next speakers are Bruce and Gina Umstead, and they will be followed, we're going to be followed by Marcy Lipset, but I think she may have had to leave. And so Lawrence Mulban, Milburn will be after Bruce and Gina Umstead. You can start. Hello, thank you for hearing from us today. We're going to talk about the future of Michigan education and our vision about all students being engaged in meaningful tasks that result in authentic and beautiful work. We're really excited to be here and about the vision of Michigan being in the top 10 education states in the country in the next 10 years. It is um, a great task, a great challenge. I've been sitting and listening for a few hours and have counted at least 20 different aspects of the educational system that you've been asked as a State Board of Education to address. Um, our conversation is about curriculum. We want to add to the discussion in, in that respect. And so I want to start by asking you a question. Basically, imagine the kind of work that you want students to engage in in the classroom. Take a few minutes to think about what, what do I want students to be doing? What kind of work should they be engaging in? We're supposed to think about that. Just think about it. You can write it down if you want. Well, Bruce and I had the opportunity to answer that question because I am an associate professor of education at Central Michigan University, and I was given a sabbatical last year. And we decided that the kind of education that we wanted our students to have, our two children, is um, was offered at High Tech High in San Diego, California. And High Tech High is nationally and internationally recognized as a leading educational system. They educate 5,000 students in San Diego. And people visit the school every day from around the country and from around the world. One of the things that we like about High Tech High, which we don't have time to tell you everything, was they changed the conversation from asking whether students can read they don't ask whether they can add, whether they can pass a test, but instead they ask, are they going to graduate from college? And what we found is that in high-tech high, 
Although they have 45% of their students who get free and reduced lunch, 17% of whom are students with disabilities, they have 99% of their students who attend college and 89% who graduate from college. Those are impressive statistics. Um, since 2008, um, when I first found High Tech High, um, going to a conference on behalf of MDE in San Diego, it was my dream uh, for the students, uh, our students to attend a school like High Tech High. Worked pretty hard here at the department um, trying to bring those types of programs to Michigan. Uh, so you can imagine how excited I was to be able to take a year and actually study and look at um, the different parts, right? You expect to get in there and they're adding this and they're taking away that and they're, they're doing all these different things. And after a month or two of the nice weather and everything kind of fading into the background, you kind of realize that they just have a general philosophy that's different than most educators. And yes, these are public educators operating on public dollars, much like the schools here in Michigan, much at the same rate. And their vision is really that the purpose of learning in this century is not simply to recite inert knowledge, but rather to transform it. It is time to change the subject. Right? They look at integrating learning, so they don't have a CTE program because it's built into the courses. They don't divide students up. Every student takes every class, including 60% minority, 45% free and reduced lunch, 17% special needs. The special needs support is built into the classroom that even my daughters could take advantage of. The teachers are set up as designers. Now imagine that if we respected our highly trained educators in Michigan to be the designers of their learning. And then the students are the owners. It's not their fault for not learning. They are the owners of the learning. The student agency um, that's at High Tech High is something that I have not experienced any other place. Now our daughters are very privileged. They're very fortunate um, to have parents that have the means that we've had. But to see the change in learning, that both of these kids coming back want to be teachers, and they want to be in education, that they want to take ownership of their learning, we're excited about this next year. We feel terribly about the students here in Michigan that didn't have the opportunity to go to High Tech High on a sabbatical. We also feel terrible for those students that don't get a chance to really own their own learning. And that's really why we changed the presentation today and decided to talk more about curriculum changes as opposed to technology or anything else that you might expect from us. The key things we learned from High Tech High is that they focus on equity, dignity, then deeper learning, and then transforming education. It's a deep, profound change. We believe Michigan can do it. It starts here at the table to incorporate those, those values at the top. Thank you. Thank you for being here again. Thank you for staying and presenting to us. We appreciate it. Approaching the table now is Lawrence Milburn, and he will be followed by Sherry Wells. For who? Sure, we'll let you do that one. Good afternoon, Superintendent Winston and President Austin. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lawrence Melvin. I'm the president of the Davis Aerospace Technical Advisory Committee and the Davis Aerospace Community PTA. I listened with great interest at uh, your last meeting and, and this meeting as presenter after presenter attempted to define the failure of inner city schools. What part does poverty play? What part does parent involvement play? What part do teachers play? What part does the school district play? What part does the emergency manager for those in Detroit play? And finally, what part does the state pay, play? Perhaps I can bring some clarity to the sum of these questions that er adversely affected one school in Detroit public school system. In the not too far distant past, Benjamin O. Davis Aerospace Technical High School was a world-class high school. Davis was the only high school in the country that was located on an active airport, the Coleman A. Young International Airport. We are no longer there. The first emergency manager, Robert Bob, spoke highly of Davis Aerospace on multiple occasions. It was his opinion that Davis was one of the finest schools in Detroit. And my last check, 
and one since my last check. Uh, Davis had a graduation rate 20% higher than other schools in DPS and 10% higher than the average of the state. Last night, I understand, Channel 4 indicated that uh, Davis has a 95% graduation rate last year, the highest in Detroit. Davis is not a failing school. It was not, is not, and should not in the future be considered a typical high school. When most people hear what our students do on a daily basis, they don't believe it. <clears throat> Many believe that inner city kids are not capable, and this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Our kids are not failing us. We, the adults, are failing them. The Benjamin O. Davis Aerospace High School, formerly Aero Mechanics Vocational High School, over the years has maintained a stellar reputation of producing exceptional graduates. These graduates, <coughs> pardon me, Depart Davis with exceptional skill sets in aviation, science, and STEM disciplines. They are job ready with no further training necessary. How many high school students do, do you know that can disassemble an aircraft engine, reassemble it, and then fly that same engine? Or take an airplane from Detroit City Airport, fly here, and back to Detroit City Airport by themselves. Hard to find. Davis students and minority female students can do just that. As you know, Davis Aerospace is an inner city high school. It's administered by DPS in partnership with the FAA, Federal Aeronautics Administration, and the FCC, Federal Communications Commission. The licenses are granted by the FAA and FCC. Its students are mostly of color. Our graduates are unique in that they can command those high paying, highly skilled jobs that the governor is so desperately seeking. We have them right here, right now. We don't have to commission a study. We don't have to raise large sums of money to get started. We don't have to create a new training program to get started. We don't have to buy new equipment. We just have to undo much of what's done over the last few years. To include moving back to the airport, making rel relevant curriculum changes while implementing a recruiting and retention program. The recruiting and retention programs are in motion. We, however, need assistance in moving back to the airport and making relevant curriculum changes. For example, this really ticks me off, someone decided that they would trade drafting or CAD for art appreciation. Don't know how they do that. In aviation maintenance, the ability to, to read a blueprint is fundamental. You can't do that, you can't work. The school teachers Pardon me, the school teaches excellence. Good enough is not good enough. The instructors do not accept good enough, and the FAA and the FCC will not accept it. Kids will give you what you ask of them. If, you don't kn if they don't know that some adults think it's impossible. Uh, let me close uh, <laughs> by saying I just saw it. Um, it's imperative that we move the school back to the airport. We have many Tuskegee Airmen in our uh, committee that thought uh, the war was won in getting minorities into aviation in World War II. Here we are in 2015, Michigan, fighting again to get minorities into aviation. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and we should mention thank you for your service. What was your rank in the military? Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you for your service and thank, thank you for being here. Next. Sherry Wells is coming to the table and John Bindus is following her. In 2014, I ran for State Board of Education as a candidate for the Green Party. 
<laughs> in the process, I attended events many learned via the Michigan Parents for Schools organization. One was at Wayne County Community College, during which Colonel Milburn was honored for his work with Davis High School. And I w it, they also mentioned that he was a member of the Tuskegee Airmen. I sat behind two of his Davis High School subcommittee crew and told them about the Tuskegee Airmen in my life. If they hadn't gotten my father back to base every day, I wouldn't be here. Uh, Keith Hines, a Davis alumnus, invited me to their meetings, and I've been at their meetings at City Airport, and I've been a member of the crew since, trying to restore the high school that existed since 1943. Two thirds of our subcommittee are former military and Davis alumni, and the other third are moms. One member who has contact with aviation companies, Delta and Lockheed, who are asking, where are our pool of employees? We don't have them anymore. What's happened to the source? U.S. News and World Report named it in the past decade as one of the 100 best high schools in the country. It has had STEM and a connection with the local community college for decades. Um, my father grew up near City Airport, fell in love with aviation, it was in the Air Force as a navigator and a bomber. This is where the Tuskegee Airmen uh, brought him home. He learned on, through the GI Bill uh, and got his FAA certification as a pilot, as an instructor, as aircraft and maintenance. He loved working on airplane engines. He hated car engines. He was my first flying instructor, my last hours, and my license I got <coughs> at City Airport in the mid-70s from my instructor who's still a member of the Black Pilots Association. I earned a degree, a degree in education, never taught officially, because there was a, supposedly a teacher surplus at the time, even though class sizes remain too high. But I'm a teacher to the core. I've long dreamed of an after-school civil aviation program for kids that would sneak in math and science under a banner that said, you can't be, t you can't be high to fly. I learned to read in Detroit schools. My father and Colonel Milburn also learned to read in Detroit schools. The Colonel was the first African American to graduate from Detroit Aerospace High School. Despite that, while campaigning in 2014, I learned of adult literacy concerns in Kalamazoo, Muskegon, et cetera, not only Detroit. And all these cases are where minority and rural white pop poor rural white populations exist. Why in 2014 do we have that kind of literacy gap? One of my favorite memories when I worked for the Department of Social Services after getting my teaching degree was a Hispanic father who was on ADC for Unemployed Fathers and he was studying at the dining room table for his GED. And his <coughs> kids were at that table with him doing their homework because that was a big person's thing to do. Today is International Literacy Day. Two years ago, I saw a documentary called Maestra, which showed how Cuba in 1961, in one year, went from 27% literacy to 95%. They used young people, uh, males and females, that as a result of that experience were propelled into careers, and we can do that. You know many districts are under the so-called failing district list, yet only the minority ones have emergency managers. The same system, the emergency manager system, that is destroying not only Davis High School, but Detroit and other public school systems as well. In the past 20 years, I became hooked on history, the real people history. I learned that it was against the law before the Civil War to teach African Americans to read. It appears to be de, de facto against the law now. Thank you for your comments. Next. Our next speaker is John Bindis, followed by Linda Brundage. Hello. <coughs> Thank you for giving me a chance to speak today. My name is John Bendis, and I'm the executive director of the School Community Health Alliance of Michigan. And I'm here to talk today about how to make Michigan a top 10 education state. Uh, the School Community Health Alliance, we represent 118 school-based health, school-based and school-linked <coughs> health centers across the state, 99 of which are state-funded. 
school-based health centers are primary care pediatric offices located in schools or linked closely to schools. These centers also offer services in mental health and some offer dental as well. They are located in areas where the families are economically disadvantaged and struggle to access medical services. These families generally have lower income jobs and they can't find the time to take off to take the children to a, a doctor's office or they do not have the transportation to do so. These populations of children also contain the kids that are homeless. In today's high schools, they refer to that as couch surfing. They may not know where they will sleep tomorrow, tomorrow night, but they do have a determination to receive a quality education. When I took this position in January, one of the first things I did was tour a number of the centers, and one of the first centers I toured was right here in Lansing. When I was touring it, I was talking to the physician's assistant because I noticed a large cabinet full of orange peanut butter crackers, and I didn't understand why they were there. And I asked her why they had so many orange peanut butter crackers, and she said that was for the Monday morning belly aches when the kids come back to school because they haven't eaten over the weekend or they haven't had enough to eat. It's very difficult to learn an environment when you haven't been fed, let alone uh, in an environment where you possibly have strep throat that's not being attended to, the flu, your basic colds, migraine headaches, toothaches, or in need of mental health services brought on by personal issues such as abandonment, addiction, or death in the family. With primary care services available in school-based health centers, children are more likely to stay in school and graduate School-based health centers are strongly associated with academic improvements as well. In 2013 alone, the school-based centers across the state had over 100,000 health encounters, 22,000 of which were mental health encounters. So in my conversation today, I'll be brief, and I know the meeting's been long for all of you. So the question is, how do you make Michigan a top 10 education state? And the, suggest the two suggestions we have at the School Community Health Alliance are, one, please continue to work closely with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and to continue to support school-based health centers. And two, the need for school-based health centers in Michigan is quite large and not completely attended to. As we ask that you continue to look for opportunities to implement more centers where they are needed across the state of Michigan. Thank you for your time and have a good evening. John, thank you for being here again. Thank you for staying around. Appreciate it. Linda Brundage, please, was the next speaker, and then John Tierney will be following her. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm Dr. Linda Brundage, a mom, a grandma, a psychologist, and a person of faith. Since December 2012, when the tragedy of Sandy Hook took place, I have been a gun violence prevention advocate. I also have a history of being a public school teacher and a public school high school counselor. I want to share with you the status of gun violence in our country, and I hope it'll make you angry if you're not already angry. And I want you to get motivated and involved. This is a critical issue facing our schools today. I understand the Second Amendment, I get it that Michigan is a hunting state. However, the Second Amendment is not absolute, and there is no gun violence prevention uh, group in the nation that is coming after guns. We need common sense solutions to de-escalate the epidemic of gun violence in our country. <clears throat> One American child is killed every three hours and 15 minutes in this country. And whether the gu gun violence happens in urban Detroit, suburban Okemos, or in the upper UP, we must act now with new and stronger gun laws and policies to protect our children and communities. We live in a gun culture. Guns have become the first line of either offense or defense. Road rage in Howell, Renesha McBride killed in Dearborn, Detroit Chief of Police supporting citizens arming themselves. This all makes me very angry, and I hope it does you too. Um, the gun laws in the United States are unjust and should make us all angry and move us to act. If you want to know about the guns in the United States, you need to follow the money. 
following Sandy Hook and possibly the second election of a black president, 2013 afforded the NRA a total revenue of $345 million. Um, there was a shooting in DeWitt, DeWitt yesterday where a 15-year-old child uh, died. I think it was out of Sandy Hook that we got the language, the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And according to our Harvard researcher, Dave Hemingway, there is no evidence, no evidence, that having more guns reduces crime. Nearly eight children, ages 18 and younger, are shot and killed every day. Gun violence kills more than 33,000 Americans every year. A criminal, terrorist, domestic abuser, or anyone in, with intent on harm can buy a gun online or at a gun show without a background check. Holders of concealed weapons permit can open carry in our school districts. And I think we all know that. Okay, just a couple more horrifying notes. Guns killed more preschoolers in one year than they did law enforcement officers in the line of duty. And gun deaths in the United States since 1968 exceed the casualty totals from all U.S. wars. Children and young adults constitute 38% of firearm deaths and non-fatal injuries. In two years since the mass shooting at Newtown, there have been 136 school shootings, including fatal and non-fatal assaults, suicides, and unintentional shootings, an average of about one a week. Regardless of the individuals involved in the shooting or the circumstances that give rise to it, gunfire in our schools shadows, shatters the serene security that these institutions are meant to foster. As of September 4th of this year, there have been six school shootings, one hostage taking, taking this year. Um, trying to watch the time. So what do we do? We have to educate ourselves and our communities about gun violence. Know things like Michigan is a stand your ground state, second after Florida and particularly for this body of people, open carry is legal in our schools. And we expect tomorrow um, legislation to be introduced that is being um, sold as a compromise bill to have concealed carry in the schools. My organization, uh, Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, doesn't think we should have any guns in the schools. So, I would urge all of you to contact your constituents and have them write, call, supporting House Bill 4261. If we can get 4261 passed, Andy Shore has introduced that this is the second legislative session, that will save our school districts tremendous amounts of money. You know Clio is already in the legal process. Ann Arbor schools is in the legal process. Only the lawyers and the gun lobby are getting rich on that. Um, our districts are spending huge amounts of money on um, oh, vestibules that are gun proof and that sort of thing. Um, so 4261 not only will protect our children because that will make our schools in fact gun free zones by closing the open carry loophole it will also save our school districts lots of money and i'd rather 11 than 11 million dollars be sent, spent in rockford on vestibules that people can't get beyond i'd like that 11 million dollars to be spent on reading or health education or whatever so, please contact your House of Representatives people. Ask all of your constituents to get active on this very important issue. We cannot have guns in our schools. We need our teachers to be able to teach, our administrators able to administrate. 
we don't want them having to worry daily about the potential dropping of a gun that could kill a giant teacher. It doesn't matter if you have a CCW or concealed carry permit or not. Um, 10 hours of training or 12 hours of training does not make one able to respond in one of these horrific kinds of things. And let's not have that horrific thing take place in Michigan. So um, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank I you. appreciate your thank time. Thank you, Linda. John Tierney is next, and he'll be followed by Sharon Tolf. ready when you are. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is John Tierney. I am from Rochester, Michigan. I'm here as a public citizen uh, to talk to you on making Michigan a top 10 education state. Uh, just before the Mr. Cook and Mr. Hecker from the teachers unions mentioned uh, bold solutions. So this folder is about those bold solutions. Um, I'm looking at this from the perspective of global competition. Uh, and what we need to do here in Michigan is to get out of the cream of the crop education model that we've been running for years. Uh, that model uh, prevents us from competing on a global scale. So what I wanted to do today, because I only have a few minutes, is go through the folder and let you know that what I've put together for you. Um, when we look at the cream of the crop education model, just to give you sort of a mindset, uh, our population is 322 million in America. The cream of the crop education model is about a 20% model, which means we have about 64 million smart people. If you just look at India and China, that's 2.6 billion people. If they were just using a 10% model, that's about 266 million smart people. So we basically have four times as less smart people as just those two countries alone. So how do we solve this problem? Well, first we need to identify the key constraint which is in our system. In the folder, I have a mind map that looks at the summative assessment system and the fact that after we test these children and find out exactly what they don't know, which means what has not transferred into long-term memory, which they can be used in the future, we give them no actionable intelligence to improve themselves. Yes, we give them a ranking, but that is not going to help them identify their weaknesses and then improve on those. So. The second piece of paper in here is bringing PLM to education, which is applying human performance technology to state standardized tests. I did this while I was at Purdue uh, in my master's learning and design program, <coughs> and I looked at the education system from that point of view. And I would hope that you would take the time to look at this, read it, and what it does is it brings the teachers into the system on the front end to help design the assessments and at the same time, the feedback modules and the professional development that would allow our kids to uh, strengthen their weaknesses. Um, the third paper uh, that I have in here is Enabling PLM for Education. Uh, that shows how PLM, which is product lifecycle management software that is used by GM, Ford, Chrysler, uh, aerospace companies, consumer goods companies, that would allow learning theory and instructional design to be used in the classroom on a consistent and systematic basis. Another thing I have in here that go, dates back to around 2010-2011 is the support letters for this vision. Uh, the first one I have in here is from Michigan State University from Professor Jeff Rabel who is now the chair of the rhetoric and writing department there. And the last sentence that I would like to share with you is, should the technology issues relating to building this platform get solved, we are prepared to leverage this platform to support experimental teaching and learning inventions across the state of Michigan. So the key here 
is to put in the capability that would allow us to solve these problems. Many of us and many of the groups here have talked about poverty and how we are going to compete. The problem is that we, don't, we do have the ability, we just don't have the capability to collaborate and solve this problem at scale. And the last paper that I have left in here for you is the educational life cycle management paper that I wrote with three professors from, uh, from Oakland University and that lays out the techno technological specifications for this. So all I really ask you to do, since I only have five minutes today, is to look through the folder, read it, and I think, and I'm very confident that it will change your mindset on what is possible in education, and then also give you the ideas and the structures of what is possible going forward. I have left my business card in there, I know through the board that through emails I can answer any other questions for you. Uh, if any of you would like to speak on this in a more deeper level, you're more than welcome to call me personally. And Superintendent Wiston, if you'd like to have a conversation in this regards, I'd be happy to speak in this on a deeper level with you as well. So that is all my time. Thank, thank you, you very John. Much thank for you for staying and for sharing with us. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sharon Toth is the next speaker, and then um, Michelle has something to read. Good afternoon. I, I'm Sharon Toth. I am the CEO of United Dairy Industry of Michigan. I'm also a registered dietitian, and I represent Michigan's 1,800 dairy farm families. Um, Michigan dairy farmers have nearly a 90-year legacy of supporting school nutrition programs, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, <coughs> I want to make sure that you're aware of the growing body of research that demonstrates the science behind the learning connection. That is, <coughs> the relationship between improved nutrition, increased physical activity, and academic performance. I think maybe you have heard some of the studies about breakfast. Studies indicate that participation in breakfast at school means that kids are on time for school and they so they miss <coughs> less school. Uh, they have better attention and behavior while they're in class. They also have higher math and verbal fluency scores and they perform better on standardized tests. Additionally, there are studies that show that students who are more active during school and on weekends perform better on standardized tests for reading and math and spelling. It's compelling research, um, and that is why our Michigan dairy farmers have been supporting the expansion of school breakfast in Michigan for several years and also supporting school wellness programs. Michigan dairy farmers have contributed millions of dollars in support of the expansion of school breakfast over the past several years and through our partnership with the Michigan Department of Education they are very proud that now 50 percent more students participate in breakfast on a daily basis. That means uh, over a hundred thousand kids each day start their day ready to learn. But we also know that there's still hungry kids out there and that hungry kids can't learn. And so I want to encourage you to continue to pursue this as a priority. One other area that dairy farmers are working on diligently is to fight childhood obesity by engaging students in the Fuel Up to Play 60 program. The program empowers students to encourage their peers to get active and play for 60 minutes each day and then to fuel up with nutrient-rich foods such as low-fat dairy, fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. The program is reaching about 3,000 schools in Michigan. It's one of the largest school wellness programs in the country. And schools in Michigan are highly engaged because Governor Snyder did include Fuel Up to Play 60 as a strategy in his first uh, 4x4 wellness plan. So I'd like to continue, again, engagement with the schools. Schools have made Fuel Up to Play 60 a part of the way they do business because of the state agency engagement. Um, more than half of the adults when we survey them, there's over a thousand adults in Michigan schools involved in the program and they say the program is making a difference and it's because of that student leadership. They say that kids are more active and they say that kids are eating more dairy, 
fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. So I just encourage you to stick with something that's, that's working and helping our kids improve their performance. On September 29th, UDIM, along with our state agency partners, are sponsoring a rally for school health. And I'd like to invite you to attend if you're available. Um, over 30 schools from around the state are coming to Ford Field to learn how to uh, engage in the Fuel Up to Play 60 program to get kids back in their school um, making healthier choices. And if you're available, it's really an amazing day. Um, each school team will bring six students and three adult leaders. And um, I just invite you if you're, if you're available. We all know that improved nutrition and physical activity are critical for ac academic achievement and development of our future work workforce, productivity, and military readiness. Michigan has been moving in the right direction with the expansion of school breakfast and wellness programs such as Fuel Up to Play 60. So I hope these programs remain a priority in the top 10 and 10 initiative. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for being here and thank you for waiting. <laughs> Uh, one of the speakers wasn't able to say Marcy Lipsy, but I think she sent Michelle a quick message. So, uh, Michelle, read that to us. Just from here, is that okay? Yep. Okay, cool. um, hold on. Um, this is for uh, Marcy Lipset. Um, two key points that were not covered by Lieutenant, Cal Lieutenant Governor Kelly. First and foremost, I want to thank Lieutenant Governor Kelly for coming for taking the lead on rebuilding special education in Michigan. He is truly treating special education as a nonpartisan issue as it should be. <coughs> One, when the MDE, Office of Special Education, removed the consideration slash appeal process from special education uh, written complaints in 2013, they removed all checks and balances. The findings are, um, a free-for-all across the, the uh, across counties and uh, so are the corrective actions Two, students with a specific learning disability are becoming an endangered species in Michigan the current data has 40 percent of students nationally with IEPs and eligible under a specific learning disability while Michigan is at 36 percent and the Detroit Public Schools is at 29 percent the MDEs specific learning disability criteria that created this 9% parameter on a norm referenced standardized achievement, achievement test such as a Woodcock Johnson is being used for only one purpose and that is um, being and that being to not find students eligible for special education across counties you will find a mandate of the seventh percent in Wayne County and in the fourth in Macomb what she's saying is that this artificially um, reduces the number of uh, kids with special education um, who are eligible for I IEPs, having it be just the bottom fourth percent or the bottom seventh percent, as I understand this. Okay. The application of a pattern of strengths and weaknesses is a literal free for all. Um, finally, Michigan needs to overhaul our teacher preparation program so that both the general ed and the special ed teachers know how to provide evidence-based reading, writing, and math instruction to students with dyslexia, hyperlexia, dysgraphia, and, oh boy, I can't, I have dyslexia, okay. Um, dis, how do you say that? Dis, dyscalculia, dyscalculia, dyscalculia. new. I don't know that one and then create scientifically driven criteria to tr determine the existence of, of a specific learning disability. Sincerely, Marcy Lipset. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Who was that for? Normally, uh, oh, normally we go to introduction of new employees, but there are none. So the next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. Does anyone have any questions of staff for the grant criteria that we presented in the agenda? Richard? Uh, now there's two sets of F and uh, J. Which, <laughs> which are we dealing with, or both, or just one or the other? F right now. None for that. Okay. Anyone else on F? All right. 
Last item on the committee a whole agenda. Oh, we did the presentation. Sorry. We're not doing that again. <laughs> Approval of the State Board of Education minutes is the next one. Approval of the minutes from the regular and the committee of the whole meeting of August 11th, 2015. The chair will entertain a motion. So moved. Support. Moved and supported. Any questions, comments, discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. President's report. Well, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to eschew any president's report. Plus, I'd love to say eschew. eschew. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to need a process to pull together all that we've heard and towards putting yes. our um, game plan together. So we'll work with Brian on that. Thanks. We're not going back to that education. No, we'll come back to the next meeting. At the last, uh, so the superintendent's report, uh, at the last uh, month's board meeting, social studies standards and science standards were presented, and we announced public information sessions across the state. Everyone is invited to attend the sessions to receive information and share your comments. They're supposed to be shared on the screen, but they're not, so we'll get those put back out. Or do you have them coming? All right, well, we'll make sure that people are aware of that. Also, we're going to be holding some sessions at the legislature for legislative staff, and that will be part of it as well, where staff members of legislators can come and ask questions on that and other topics that, uh, that we need to stress with them. So I know that people have been making comments and showing up at the sessions, and we thank everybody for that input. Normally at this time, we go to Rick uh, Joseph's <coughs> presentation. Did he send one in? It's linked to the agenda. A written report is linked to the agenda. Okay. And certainly we understand why he couldn't be with us today. I congratulate him for making the choice of being in the classroom <laughs> first day of school. So that was a good choice. But we do miss him. But he'll be back at our next meeting. This, next we move to discussion and action items. State and federal legislative update. Marty Ackley will come forward and give a state and federal update. And then Cassandra may have some issues as well. And then Kathleen Strauss. <laughs> Everybody might have issues. <laughs> we all have our issues. Yes. Keep your issues low. I will be. Uh, I'll be brief. Also, uh, we had a meeting of the legislative committee on September second. Um, there were a few issues discussed. Uh, one was the education evaluation, educator evaluation legislation. We weren't able to get that uh, presentation in earlier, <coughs> but that legislation continues to be um, being discussed, let's say, in the, in the legislature. And the um, committee discussed the fact that we want to continu continue yeah, okay. um, um, its position that it made a year ago and um, supported the um, direction that Brian had, has given as to if the legislature does not move forward that we would move forward, the, the department would move forward with the um, with the idea of going with much of what the ball proposal said. Yeah, certainly, we hope the legislature passes a bill, but if they don't, as you heard from presentations, people are waiting and the evaluations are waiting, and so we need to move forward. We encourage the legislature to pass and are working with them to get that to happen, but if they don't, we will move forward with our, with our uh, process. Right. And we also discussed the, uh, the third grade reading level bills that have been introduced. Uh, we have found out that there is a um, House Education Committee meeting scheduled for Thursday, testimony only. Um, but there are some several concerns that have been raised, not only in the committee meeting, but since then, about um, the cost, the financial concerns of the reading bills, it's, whether it's prescriptive or not, um, the impact on IEPs. Um, and from what we understand, what actually we read, I read in the Gauntlet today, was that um, uh, Chairman Price will be considering an exemption for students with IEPs to the prescriptive nature of the of the bill. So we are continuing to work with the with the um, chairman, who's also the um, author of the bills on those on those bills. And we also discussed, obviously, not obviously, but um, interestingly, um, the um, open carry law. Mm -hmm. And Representative Shore's bill, the which what? the the open, open carry, carry on oh. on handguns, which was yes. discussed here, and, and and so I don't know if Cassandra wants to Before discuss. Before we do that, could I just on the teacher evaluation piece? Mm -hmm. I think we also discussed that the legislative meeting, uh, this board had endorsed formally uh, 
the recommendations of the Ball Commission and encourage legislation <coughs> that track those recommendations as closely as possible, supporting you know, research-based uh, evaluation practices, including teacher performance that helps teachers get better at teaching and are broadly supported by the stakeholders in education, administrators, teachers, and so I think we continue to reiterate uh, our hope that legislation will, will support uh, high quality teacher evaluations, consistent uh, approaches throughout the state, and appreciate uh, Brian's uh, interest in helping further similar high quality teacher evaluation uh, protocols uh, through our department and offices if legislation fails to materialize. Cassandra, did you have something? Uh, no, I think that's a good wrap up. Um, regarding the concealed weapons. Um, Bill, uh, we did talk about what would be the best way for the board to demonstrate support um, that um, for the bill and and the time frame for doing so. So we don't have anything to bring to the board at this time, but um, possibly by the next board meeting we will have um, something. Right. I hope so. What? I thought we had <coughs> agreed well, on it. We should bring a statement, but we never done. We it what we said was um, we were waiting for the department to give us a little more information on um, what the movement of the bill was going to be. If there's going to be some timing or anything like that, yeah. Okay. And to okay. be clear, it's it's for the it's for House Bill 4261, it and is. not the one that's going to be introduced. Lupe, I'll come back to you in a minute. Kathleen, do you have anything you want to add on NASBY? Kathleen Strauss, anything you want to add on that? Well, just at the, uh, with that, with the last meeting of the Government Affairs Committee, they, uh, I, felt, I learned that this, the uh, House and Senate had not yet named members to the, the uh, conference, conference committee. committee. Oh, you know, the committee. So they hadn't done anything. And though the chairs, the chair and the ranking member want them to discuss the bill, the bills, whatever comes out of the, uh, the committee, this month, they think that with the RAND debate, that's one thing, and the budget, which is good, that there, was a, there was a movement among some uh, senators to defund Planned <coughs> Parenthood, and if they don't, to hold up the approval of the budget, and that will take priority over the education issue. It's incredible to me, but that seems to be what the consensus was in, in Washington. Mm. There's always something, huh? It's always something yeah. that comes in the way of uh, taking this bill up. Plus, they have to come to some agreement before they can take it up. Yeah. All right, Lope, did you have something on legislative? No, I, I have some, yes, on, on the open carry. Yep. Okay, now, according to the lady that came to speak, the Coalition for Gun Safety, she mentioned that the, the bill was going to be discussed tomorrow. Is, is no, no, no. it's not scheduled she, at all. What, did she, what there, did she say? There's a bill apparently going to be introduced tomorrow, which what she characterized as a compromise bill that would allow for concealed um, weapons in a school, which I think would be mm -hmm. contrary to what the committee would support. They, they, yeah. the, the discussion at the committee meeting was that you would support the Andy Shore bill, Representative Shore, 4261, which would prohibit open carry or prohibit basically any, any, guns. any, any guns, guns in schools. Well, yeah, but that's what she said. No, yeah. it's not. She said tomorrow there's going to be another bill introduced that would, instead of having open carry, allow con those with a concealed weapons yes, permit right, right. to conceal a weapon on school grounds. Right. But, there's, but they're not being taken up in committee tomorrow. Correct. It's just being introduced. Correct. There's no action okay. being okay. scheduled. Okay. Okay. okay, so when is it the appropriate time then to write something in behalf of the board? To me, I, think, I think what we said is we would find out for the board, the committee, the schedule of if they're going to take up the bills and when, so you would have that information to make your decision with. Well, I, my feeling is I think we should take the leadership in urging them to take up the bill and saying that, that, that I we agree. should prevent open or any carrying of weapons in a school building. C concealed and not or wait for open them carry. to come up with a date. I think we should point, encourage them to do it. There's no place for guns in schools, period. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so 
I met with her and 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 some KISD folks on exactly this issue. No open carry and no concealed weapons. And and so um, she she was going to be in town, so she wanted to come to the meeting. Now next month, one of our superintendents that is very adamant about no guns in my school district is going to come and speak. So every every week every month, I'm going to try to get somebody to come and speak on that. All right. So my question again is, when is the right time? To me, the what did you say? And and my eyes wandered when she said this. Three children are killed every day in the United States. Three children. Eight. Or eight. Every even Okay, hours. let's say one. One child is three killed hours. in the United States every day. That is potent. So we <coughs> should take a lead. I agree with, with Catherine 110%. We have to be ready. We have to take the lead. We are the State Board of Education that are supposed to be looking out for all these children that we have in our schools. It, I was a teacher for a long time and there's no way that I would agree with concealed weapons or open carry or only if you are licensed to like a police officer or something like that. But everybody and anybody, and, and they're, they are very strong about their position. and. And this group, and any group that I belong to on gun safety, we're not to take their guns away. We're not organized to take <coughs> their guns away. We just want gun safety in the schools. And, and so my position as a board member is that we, that right now is the right time to introduce something, to start thinking about drafting something. We need to be, be prepared. So, yeah, I think if the committee would like to draft something and share it with all state board members to get their input and take possible action at a future meeting, that's fine. John? Yeah, I was going to say the same. I mean, we should be willing to say, and I think we are even today, there's no place for guns in schools, period. But we need to be able to say, that's why we as a board encourage you to support this bill, oppose this bill, uh, to make that recommendation clear. So let's get that written down and bring it back to us. All right. Any other legislative issues? Um, no. I, I just had a quick. Yes, sir. On the evaluation, I think we also discussed in our committee meeting um, <laughs> the fact that the 50% rule was supposed to come in, that 50% of the test scores, or 50% of the evaluation for teachers was supposed to be based on these test scores. Mm -hmm. And that although the schools themselves, on the top to bottom, you know, the, with the waiver of the federal government that's given a pass, that the, the teachers are, are not, and that there needs to also be some. Whatever the proposal is, it should honor that. It should honor the fact that there's all these changes and teachers should not be held to that uh, standard because it's unfair. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's one reason we need the legislature to pass a bill, because if they don't, then we have to go with the 50%. Mm -hmm. I don't have the authority to change that. But mm -hmm. if the 50% is in place, we will give recommendations to local districts how to use state and local assessment and come up with that measurement. And we will share that with the board before it goes out, before we make any final decisions. I wanted to, I'd like to ask a question about the uh, early literacy, the third grade reading bill. With the presentation this morning, with the programs that, that the department is working on, how does all that fit with the bill? What does the bill call for that to be done? We're already doing it. We're in line with the recommendations that came out as part of the package of bills uh, last year and it's in line with where they're heading this year so what we're doing is in alignment okay. with what's happening okay. now we have some concerns with some of the legislation and we're sharing those concerns but certainly and overall this is an important issue to work collaboratively on to get resolved but there are things in the bill that we don't like correct but we taking it pushing what we don't you know do we something we, about what we yes don't we like? have shared very clearly with the committee the things that we like the things we don't like and recommendations on how they could change it absolutely in line with what we had heard from the department and the board previously Ben sent something out last week Ben sent something out last week 
Oh, well, kind describe of it. Oh, you will use this, yeah. my computer. Yeah. Right oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. The, the last thing it's I had, you um, ask, my you uncle ask from me. North Carolina um, emailed me this, that, <laughs> <laughs> um, that uh, what is it, Colbeck? Colbeck? It's under Colbeck. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, you, has proposed some legislation around um, social studies. Uh, I don't know if it specifically mm -hmm. mentioned Howard Zinn or um, some sort of um, a position on, uh, and I can't remember the article, so, but I know that he has some legislation that impacts the social studies and, and, and making sure that certain curriculum or actually banning certain books and teaching that curriculum, including like Howard Zinn. Are you familiar with? There was some legislation of Senator Kobach that was actually passed that um, um, encouraged school districts to include certain things in their social studies curriculum, like the Constitution, founding fathers, things right. like that. I don't know if a if a, if a specific. Well, we'll look it up and get back to you. It, it was an article about it. I didn't see the actual legislation. And okay. So I, but it, I believe it was uh, also banning um, the. People's History of the United States. Uh, if I may speak, to, I read the article in okay. question, and he specifically says that's not what he see. advocates. Okay, you you at, you talked to him about that. I mean, no, I just read the article. I read the article <laughs> too, and that's not what I. Well, we'll we'll look it up. He was we'll very critical of Zinn and said and look pointed up, out please. that there are these things that are missing, and that's why we need to have them in uh, social studies curriculum, so that uh, that was we, the. We should have been using anyway. I should, I'll well, we'll clarify. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We appreciate you bringing it up, and okay. we'll clarify it. Okay. All right. The next item on today's <laughs> agenda is approval of the State Board of Education meeting schedule for 2016. The State Board uh, Executive has proposed a meeting schedule. The exceptions to the normal meeting schedule, which is the second Tuesday of each month, are September 14th, which is the second Wednesday because of a holiday. November 15th, which is the third Tuesday, avoiding Election Day, and the board retreat would be May 24th, the fourth Tuesday of the month. Other than that, all meetings are at the second Tuesday of the month. Is there a motion to accept? The second. The schedule has been moved and supported. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next item on today's agenda is discussion and action on National Association of State Boards of Education NASB bylaws, public education petitions, and board of directors. Lupe is our NASB delegate, and she'll lead the discussion. I'm sorry, but it's going to be like 30 minutes. Ah, no, no, no. <laughs> we are now moving to adjournment. <laughs> okay. Okay, now, uh, that, uh, first of all, let me tell you that the conference, the annual conference is uh, October 22nd to the 24th. I am registered to vote, I mean, to attend. Are you, um, Dr. Yes. Ziley? Dr. Ziley, of course, is running for office, so uh, he's, uh, and of course, we ha I think we have made history in this uh, conference because we have two uh, Michiganders that will be recognized. Uh, Honorable uh, Eileen Weiser and and Mayor uh, Hardwell from yep. from Grand Rapids, and then uh, I'll talk about you in a minute. Okay, uh, so we, we we received uh, some information electronically concerning uh, the um, the board of uh, elections of the board of directors, as well as proposed changes to the NSB, uh bylaws. And, and propose public education positions on school funding and teacher equity. So um, the first thing that I would like to share with you is the, the positions that are open for um, the Board of, of Directors and uh, the, for president uh, elect, uh, we are gonna have an election and the two that are running is uh, Dr. Ziley from Michigan and Jay Barth from Arizona. And then for secretary, so. secretary Treasurer, we have Scott Johnson from Georgia and the Central Area Director, we have Brooke, and I cannot say that name, A-X-I-O-T-I-S. Axiotis. Exiotis from IA, Iowa. Iowa, from Iowa. 
So I guess uh, my question to you, and I need a motion as to who we recommend for us to support uh, at the convention. I would hope it'd be our member. Dr. Z have the country benefit from Dr. Z. It's w been moved and supported by uh, John and Eileen. Any comments, questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed the same? Mm -hmm. All right, then you had one other one there? Well, there's a, 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 some changes in the bylaws, in, in, uh, but it's, it's long. Well, can we just have your, is your recommendation yeah, that we support them? Then yeah, we'll take yes. your and Dr. Zeile and I concur, right? Yep. All right, so there's a, a recommendation by Lupe and Richard to move the uh, changes in the bylaws, correct? All right, any discussion? I'll just comment there, um, uh, updating uh, to accommodate uh, NASB's recent practice and uh, other conditions, so they're not, they don't represent major change or even minor change in <laughs> policy. They, they just want to change. Yeah. All right, anything else? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed the same? Motion carries. Anything else on NASB? Oh, thank you. Ascent agenda. Richard, what item did you have a question on? I had uh, there, I really appreciate, uh, it's on uh, the report, the grant awards on J, and I really appreciate putting the uh, uh, numbers there, because when I see a big number like 220 million, it makes me want to <laughs> check them out. <laughs> and uh, I was looking at the two, um, uh, Allocations for um, oh. uh, no, actually, great it was start. a great start. Reading this, reading readiness. programs, readiness, readiness. readiness. Um, and uh, let's see, the one is two fourteen to fifteen, and then the other one is two fifteen to sixteen. And uh, now I got to type in my password. <coughs> How can you apply for a great start readiness program grant? <laughs> that that <laughs> does. That amount of money. That, 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 yeah. I had a couple of questions on them, and um, now I'm looking at the uh, the form uh, for the 215 216. Both of them state under the point three background person grant program, great start readiness program since 31st year. Is that correct? What, what item are you on? I'm. First. Of the superintendent. It's on item. Yeah. I'm on J seven or nine under the earlier grants report. Oh, yeah, okay. both both seven and nine have the same oh, language gotcha. in here. On the so you're on the 2000. You're on eight, which is 2015-16 or 2014-15. Right now, I'm looking at 2015-16, which is eight. Which is eight. And point three, background purpose of grants. Uh, it says uh, great service program grants eligible <laughs> to establish and expand high quality preschool programs designed to improve readiness and subsequent achievement in children at risk uh, of school failure. Uh, great start readiness program is in its 31st year. Is that? So that's number eight he's talking about. He's talking about eight. Nine. Yeah, nine is where I'm at. Sorry, Eileen, I got you. Okay. I can't yeah. hear you, Susan. Number nine is what she's asking clarification yeah. for. So what are you asking specifically? On point three. Yes. It says that the Great Start readiness program is in its 31st year. Yes. Is that r true? Yes. 30 wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. I yeah, thought. It, it I started with a million dollars in 1985 and 86. Wow. And then it's been added on to and dramatically <laughs> in the last two years. Okay. Um, and and 31 years ago, was it called Great Start reading readiness program? No, it's called the Michigan. Readiness. Okay, all right. It, that not, it did become great start until a few years ago when everything early childhood started to be called the great start fill in the blank. Okay, that, that's why I'm confused here. Yeah, okay. It used to be the 
Michigan School Readiness Program? Uh, okay. Um, okay. To clarify, item seven is, is really reflecting the um, changes and allocations for the 2014-15 school year. And item nine is reflecting the allocations for the 2015-16 school year. Understood. Uh, and the allocations themselves, are these apportioned on a per pupil ba basis, per pupil served, program, program there's capacity? A, um, there's a formula in the legislation, section 39, that tells how the slots are allocated. And it's a formula and it's based on poverty and number of kids in schools, as well as then how many students <coughs> in the previous years. So there's like three, four different passes with the formula um, allocated money. Okay. But it's in the, leg in the actual legislation. And then um, what were the changes based on? The changes um, yeah. from in 2014-15? Yes. Why would you take, yeah. um, some people will request more slots and say they can in fact use the slots. And for instance, like we've had a situation in Detroit where some of the facilities haven't, don't get licensed as quickly as people originally thought, and so then they'll return the slots. And then we reallocate them to another um, ISD. So to, to get the, you have these certain preconditions, and then you propose so many slots, yeah. and then the, and yeah. then you're awarded the money, but if the and slots then, don't materialize, then some of the money is returned and reallocated. Right. and then it's okay. reallocated out. And so okay. we do that on a regular basis during the fiscal year to try to use all of the slots. Okay. Uh, and these are uh, through the ISDs? Yes. Mm -hmm. And... So are the, these aren't ISD operated programs. No, these are local district they're operated they're programs, they're but the money comes through the ISD does. Organizations. The ISD allocates out the funds to community-based organizations and local education. So we have a community-based Head Start program and it would apply yep. through this program. Yep. Okay. To, to, the, a, to their okay. ISD. Yeah, the okay. legislature requires that 30% of the slots for each ISD go to community-based organizations. Oh, okay. And Head Start is considered a community-based organization. Very good. Thank you very much. Help. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying uh, that, Richard? that for me. Yep. All right, moving to the consent agenda. Are there any items the board wishes to have removed from the consent agenda prior to the vote? I move the consent agenda approval. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of vote, say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Comments by State Board of Education members. Are there any board members? Eileen. Uh, Michelle Fecto, Kathleen Strauss, and I were at the Michigan Science Center uh, Social Studies and Science hearings. I made a deal with Kathleen that I broke, saying that if she went over to the Social Studies uh, uh, hearing, I would replace her halfway through because the science standards discussions became fairly intense and I needed to see it through. So I don't, and you and I both stayed there. One of the points that was brought up after the Science Center hearing, which was um, uh, attended by everything from university professors to uh, master teachers who had helped with the development of the standards to parents who sounded like they were for it, or at least neutral, parents who were against it, uh, teachers who wanted intensely detailed information about how to make it work. Um, after that session, uh, I was approached by um, a, uh, uh, an activist who pointed out that the social study standards, it took me a few minutes to understand we were switching standards, but that the social study standards, the second paragraph reads that we are a constitutional democracy. We're not. 
So uh, the issue then became, how do you deal with that? I'm here to say that the department has been extraordinarily open about this. The reason we were having the hearings yeah. is to have people point out what's going, you know, what's we'll right and what's those wrong. Kinds of things, yeah. And one of the issues on this is that that can't be in print. But you heard this morning that the people from Grand Rapids, the businessmen from Grand Rapids, said that our democracy needs this. And my husband was a U.S. ambassador. Uh, the One of the mantras was that there had never been a war between <coughs> two functional democracies, of which the U.S. is always considered to be one. So the founders of the United States were looking at the French Revolution, trying to figure out how you can get by the uh, turmoil of a direct representational form of government, chose the republic form of government for that and other reasons, and that's where we are. But we consider ourselves to be a democracy. So the department's going to be wrestling with this. The bottom line is you can't put the two words constitutional democracy in the same sentence. And uh, we have been called to justice on that. There may be more things like that in the, in the standards that are conventional wisdom, but they're not accurate. So I urge everyone to get involved in this. Uh, that's why we wanted to have these hearings. And you see their posters. Yeah. Like, that's why I, it was my entree. Yeah. So Kathleen, you were the veteran of the social studies uh, uh, hearings. How did that go? Well, somebody said that there too. Oh. It's been the same person. No, she wasn't there. She was over in our hearing the entire well, time. So they have a thing going. <laughs> but that's why we're having the hearings. We're going to address things right. that come up. Well, yep. Most important, yeah. I want to point out that the department that, that uh, uh, Stephen, who held this, was spectacular in, in calling on different groups of people, trying to make sure that as many people as possible got heard. All of the comments were on the wall by topic. Uh, they urged people again and again to submit uh, uh, these post-it notes, these large post-it notes, with as much specificity as possible. They were listed by topic. They uh, said that they were being taken back to the department. I have confidence in the way that it's being structured. But I can tell you that the standards themselves, as posted, will become people be coming up with comments, some of which are going to be very accurate, and some of which will be um, things that we can't deal with because they may not be specifically academic. Uh, the yeah. process is working, though, for me. Thank you. Well, I yeah. myself ended up with questions about the social studies standards after, after the presentation. They made a few comments that I had questions with. And I spoke to Linda today about talking to her about the Absolutely. Resolving the my questions. Yep. Okay. I have to say that uh, I agree with the presentation that the uh, department is doing uh, around the state. I was invited by uh, Ben and Stephen to an activity that happened at the uh, Van Andel Institute in Grand Rapids about three weeks, four weeks ago. And Stephen did one excellent job. And it was a science audience, uh, you know, science educators and advocates and all that kind of thing. Uh, but I, I'm real proud of the work that the department does. We have outstanding people that work in this department. And everywhere that they go, they plant a big seed uh, of knowledge and information. So. I have to say that uh, I'm real proud of working with each and every one of you. Thank you. All right, so tentative agenda for next month. If there's anything you want added, please let uh, John, I, Cassandra, Michelle, Marilyn, or any of us know, and we'll get that on there. Future meeting dates, Tuesday, October 13th, regular meeting, Tuesday, November 10th, regular meeting, Tuesday, December 8th, regular meeting all at 9.30. And even though I'm Got one report we have to postpone. We're adjourning on time. <laughs> <laughs>